for interviews for boards. Our first applicant, uh, Barbara Montanera. Barbara, please. Welcome. Good evening. You could tell us some about yourself, but I believe everybody here knows, unless you would like to, we could start um, up here, whatever you'd like. Well, I have, my experience that I bring is 23 years working for the city. Um, from 87 to 93, I worked in the building and zoning department and served as secretary and um, staff not liaison, but staff coordinator for the Code Enforcement Board, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, the Board of Adjustment. Um, so I had experience with planning and zoning at that time. And the third year I was here, the city went through an entire rewrite of the land development regulations. So then after that, I was city clerk and continued to work with city codes and ordinances. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, no, I, I had. I was going to ask her to give us her background relevant to PNC, and so oh, she answered it. Sure. Um, just one question: um, Are there any other boards you'd like to serve on other than PNC? You just have planning and zoning checked off. That's my favorite because the beginning of my work career, I worked for attorneys, and I became somewhat addicted to the law, trying to read it and, and trying to understand it. So, the land development regulations, the code issues, um, appeal to me more than any other. It's not that I'd say no, but that's the one that really appeals to me. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? I don't have any. Don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either, Barbara. I've known you. Thank you very much for getting involved. Next applicant board, we've interviewed Steve Osmer. He's here. Um, would anybody like to read? Um, Sorry, these aren't my glasses. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Which, I want to... um, I'm thinking about council policies and procedures, and it says if they are applying for a different board, then they should be interviewed. But this can be brief because a lot of the questions he's already answered for us. But I think we need to go through the motion. Steve, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Steve. Um, ask you real quick. Um, code enforcement is the board this time that you're. That is correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And nothing's changed no. since you've been here the last time? No, okay. it's all the same. All right. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, we know your background. Uh, we know your history with the city from when you interviewed with us recently. And uh, just to tell us why you're interested in code enforcement. Uh, probably a lot of it actually goes back to my days in Palm Bay. Um, there was a, you know, as that city grew and got going, there was always seemed to be a lot of political strife over code enforcement. There was always issues, stuff like that. And that was something that always took me in, some interest into it and where it developed and what it comes from. And it actually talks about the safety of the citizens, the health and welfare <clears throat> of the city and the citizens, stuff like that. And again, I, I do uh, real well with codes and regulations and stuff like that. It's actually my strong point. Um, where I work now is one of the reasons I was hired, because I'm a compliance type person. That's what everything I do is based on. So that's one of the reasons I do it. It's something I, I'm interested in. Um, I come from a family of a police background anyway, so following the laws and stuff is something that's pretty well known to me. Okay, thank you. I, I have nothing. I, you know, sure. no, but thanks for uh, your continued interest in, in uh, the city and the city board. No problem. I, I actually have one question is, uh, who is the code enforcement inspector and where would I find that information? He's right over there. I, I say that because if you look through the website or if you look through the departments, if you look through the directories and stuff, and at no point does it ever say who that is. I know there's a spot on there that says if you would like to report a code enforcement, you can do that. But I was like, you see a lot of department heads and such, but it never says who that person is. So as the as the building officials, code enforcement falls under her, his jurisdiction, and without a code enforcement officer, um, he becomes the code enforcement officer. Okay, good to know. Any further questions, Steve? Steve, thank you very much. Right, thanks. At this time, any further business? This meeting is adjourned. The regular council meeting will start approximately 7 o'clock. <coughs> Oh,
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order a regular council meeting of the City of Satellite Beach, March 6, 2013, approximately 7 p.m. Please stand for a moment of silence and pledge, led by Councilwoman Gott. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. We're going to, with Council's permission, um, I'd like to do the Eagle Scout um, proclamation at this time. Hi, we're Jim C. Goldberg. Um, if you haven't, go online, look up Eagle Scout, and read what it takes. It's pretty amazing. Um, I did the other day and was amazed on what has to be accomplished. And only about 2% of all scouts start to become an Eagle Scout. So this is an official proclamation of the city of Satellite Beach. Whereas Tyler Jensen Goldberg was found worthy of the rank of Eagle Scout in the Boy Scouts of America, Troop 300. And whereas this, the award is a performance-based achievement, with only about 2% of the Boy Scouts earned. The goal of scouting are citizenship training, character development, and personal fitness. Whereas Tyler earned the following requirement badges, first aid, life-saving, citizenship in the world, citizenship in the nation, <laughs> citizenship in the community, environmental science, personal fitness, personal management, camping, family life. In addition, he earned the following elective badges, rifle shooting, oceanography, reading, astronomy, photography, pioneering, composite materials, scholarship, and electronics. <laughs> Whereas Tyler has set a personal goal to earn all Boy Scout merit badges. He is a sophomore at Satellite High School and also attends college courses at Bavard Community College. He has earned the following awards, Den Chief, Mile Slimmer, 50 Miler, World Conversation, Duty to God, Wilderness Pledge Achievement, and the Methodist Religious Four Star Recognition. Tiger, Tigers, excuse me, Eagle Scout Service Project was to design, construct canoe and kayak racks for Samson Island. So now, therefore, I, Frank Catino, Mayor of the City of Satellite Beach, Bobard County, Florida, do, do hereby offer congratulations to Tyler Jensen, Jensen Goldberg, excuse me, and publicly commend you, your Scoutmaster, and your parents for dedication, hard work, and community excellence. Your accomplishments have been brought honor to our community and serve as an outstanding example to all young people. In witness whereof, whereof I have here unto set my hand and cause the seal of Satellite Beach to be affixed this sixth day of March 2013. Thank you very, very much. Before we take a little recess, um, Mayor Schechter. That's hard I do now. <laughs> well, the great mayor has a birthday this week. This is Seven Young. So, everybody, happy birthday. Dave, check the carrot.
welcome your satellite beach friend. Happy 70th birthday, David. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody's got to enjoy the first uh, gym item. Yeah, we're going to actually, right now, we're going to oh, take uh, okay. a, a, a 10 minute recess. We can cut the cake and then we'll readjourn. Okay. 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 Okay.
Is there a cost entailed? Is it your time? Is it what? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I mean, I was just provided this ten minutes ago, so I don't know. You know what the county expects of the city, other than you know having our name associated with the process. You know, if, <coughs> if you know, there's going to be a pro. There, the ultimate process is, is there's going to be a mediation. Um, that's what the um, that's what the statute provides for. Is, is it ultimately is a mediation process to try and have the parties work out whatever their differences are, so that there isn't there doesn't have to be a, a litigation file. And then if that doesn't work out, then that option is is there if somebody wants to file a lawsuit. So uh, you know the issue becomes. And, and again, that's something I figure is going to get worked out. This is just, you know, whether or not the city wants to go along with the idea of this conflict resolution process. You know, how, how the city is ultimately going to be involved in it, I guess that's something that's going to have to be worked out. Any other comments from council? I, my concern is this. If the school board, even though they're not shutting Sea Park down, if they did not follow the intent of the agreement, well, the next time they followed the intent of the agreement, I think that's my issue with it, is if the agreement was not followed, and that's what... I will point out that, um, you know, I did some initial research when we were going through this for the preparation of the letter that the mayor signed, and it appears that the county did not, I mean, that the school board did not follow the resolution, not the intent. They didn't follow it at all in certain regards. Um, they're supposed to, I mean, again, I hadn't gone through a lot of research to find out definitely for sure, but, you know, they're supposed to provide the local governments that may or may not be affected by a school closing that there is a school closing planned. And they're obligated to do things before budgets are presented. I mean, there's just timing standards. So it appears that they didn't even follow the procedure or the protocols that are included in the resolution, the interlocal agreement. So. Um, we were spared the Sea Park, but um, what the school board has done is really wrong. And uh, um, I think uh, since we are parties to this interlo interlocal agreement, um, that it would be appropriate for us to show solidarity uh, with the other parties involved. And you know, I looked at it as the argument that we made when we went to the school board was basically based on this particular item. So um, even though Sea Park didn't get closed, you know, to me this was our primary concern was the fact that they didn't abide by what they had set in place. So I would agree with Councilwoman Gott and that we support this and at least have our name on it because that was our argument. My, <clears throat> my only concern is is that, that we know collectively how hard we worked to lobby that school board. Uh, we also know how many citizens got involved in that process. Um, so I think we did something right because obviously Sea Park didn't close. Uh, not that anybody else did anything wrong, but I think we did something right. Um, we garnered the support of the school board in keeping that school open on behalf of the whole Beachside community. I feel a little bit hesitant to not be a little bit restrained on that process of going forward because they did listen to us and, and to have our name on a letter after they've already supported this, I just don't know how well that would be received. And I understand Jim's position that they didn't follow everything, but they still listen to us, and then we'd be coming back and doing this again. So I'm, that's my concern. I also have concerns. Um, I think you both, everyone knows that I have a, a, a two young boys, one in elementary school and one in grade school. But, you know, this relationship between us and the school board is, is very important, and it's going to it needs to be there for years and years and years. I, I prefer not to support, support it. Um, yes, I can think we kind of on the war, perhaps not the battle, but it might be time for us to to step down. And we, and we did only get one year and things may change, but um, I, I'm just hesitant to um, affect that long-term relationship we have with the school board. And, uh, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Again, my feeling is that this isn't about being the schools open or closed, because obviously they did close in other areas. It's also as much about following the agreement that we signed. 
And if we're not, they're not going to follow the agreement this time, what's going to make them follow it in the future? That, that's my concern, is that if this is a next year, how are we going to learn about it? Are we going to go through the process again the same way it went this year? Are we, are we, I mean, from what you're indicating, if we put our name on this, we're not involved in any lawsuit. All we're doing is, is supporting the fact that the consensus of Brevard County and the communities that signed this are saying that the interlocal agreement wasn't followed. That's all, that's all we would be doing, right? Uh, I don't, again, I don't, I'm not positive about what what, what's the time the, schedule on this having to be done? I mean, do we need to do I this I just received tonight? it um, and brought it tonight. You know, I, because I it's 10 days, 10 from, days the, from the date of the receipt of the letter. I think it's the 27th. So 10 we days would be the, the 28th. So the, the 19th would be, or excuse me, not the 19th. The 9th would be 10 days. That's Saturday. Um, I, 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 I don't think it was... Um, so much what this council did. Uh, no council did as much as Titusville did, and they didn't prevail. And we prevailed based on some circumstances um, regarding development uh, coming in the north end of the city. But if the school board is allowed to ignore the agreements that they enter into, the next time we may be on their list and not be so lucky. Direction from council. I move that we um, join in this um, process, process um, as indicated in this letter from Attorney Knox. Yes. From Attorney Knox. I have a motion by Councilman God. Do I have a second? I'll second it. But I will, a second. I would like. It, I'd like to ask a question. Do we need to put in the motion something to the effect that we don't want to be involved in any lawsuit? We're just supporting the premise that the agreement was not followed. Let me amend my um, motion to uh, join in the uh, initial process um, and then um, if further action is needed later we will make another decision at that time. Okay, I'll second that. We got a motion by Councilwoman Goddard, second by Councilman Montanero. Um, I'm going to open this up to, for public comment. Public comment. Hear a number. Bring it back to council. Any more discussion? Yeah, I do. I, I do want to uh, put something on the record. I, I believe the school board knows their business. They have attorneys that review these interlocal agreements before they make decisions. This is not a new issue. Uh, the interlocal agreement has been out there for years. It's it's been an issue. I, I you know I was, there was talk several years ago that Surfside was going to be on the list when my, both my boys were in Surfside Elementary. So. I'm very hesitant to support this, again, because of the long-term effect it may have between the, the relationship between the school board of uh, Brevard County and the city of Satellite Beach. Any further? The only, the only comment I have, and, have, and I, I know you, you haven't, but I'm going to ask the question anyhow. Have we reached out to Amy Nisi on any of this? Um, have we had any contact with her? Uh, uh, and, I, and I know the answer is no, so, but, okay. Laura? No. No. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Passes 3-2. Any further council comments? Here none moving on to agenda item number, number five, excuse me, city attorney report. I have nothing. Okay. Moving on uh, to number six, acting city manager's report. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, in close, you'll find the secretarial order establishing the Banana River Lagoon uh, Basin Management Plan. Um, this information is being presented, um, or this is being presented as information, and Public Works Director Alan Potter is here to brief the council on the uh, contents. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had our Stormwater 101 meeting and um, informational meeting, and we went over the process of the BMAP, this, which is um, the Basin Management Action Plan. Uh, it's basically an agreement come, come together through all of the stakeholders in the Indian River Lagoon to establish um, methodologies and um, rules to meet certain criteria that have come down the line beginning in 1972. I don't want to rehash the entire Stormwater 101 presentation, but this has been a long time coming and um, we worked hard, the, the uh, stakeholders in the lagoon worked hard and are still working hard towards this process but uh, they wanted to get this thing moving, so they have uh, moved forward with the adoption of the BMAP. What that is, is holding us to the rules that they have come up with to meet the, the uh, nutrient reductions in the Indian River Lagoon. Our reductions um, for nitrogen would be about 63% reduction right now uh, for the first five year they have it split into um, uh, 15 years the first five year iteration is only trying to meet 15 percent of the the total goal which we have met and we for nitrogen we're in the uh, in the black for 841 pounds for our next iteration so we're we're pretty good there but I have to caution you that this was the low-hanging fruit, and we've been working on this since the since 2000, late 1999, 2000. Um, the same thing for phosphorus, uh, which is another of the nutrients that they're concerned about in the river that's that's impairing the the uh, Indian River Lagoon. Um, we're looking for a 61 percent reduction there, uh, and the first 15 percent we've reached with uh, we're 278 pounds to the good in phosphorus so we can use those those pounds towards our next five-year iteration but again um, the the low hanging fruit has been picked from the tree now we have to reach a little higher and the and the game is getting a little little more um, difficult and that means money so it's basically an unfunded mandate coming down saying that we have to do certain things to meet these criteria and we're working very hard to get there but the harder we try the the more the, the waters are muddied. Um, we've been working very hard with Brevard County to um, challenge some of the science not really challenge it just kind of ask some questions that didn't look to be asked and update some information that wasn't in there so we're still working hard on that and um, DEP seems to be amenable to um, at least working with us and listening to what we have to say and looking at the same things that we're looking at so we're moving in the right direction and hopefully by the time that five year the next five year um, iteration comes up some of these things will change and some of the numbers will change um, you know the numbers aren't hard and fast that they they are at least agreeable to work to change some of these numbers if they find that the science is is not adequate so um, we're still working on it but right now by the secretarial order we are held our feet are held to the fire on this so 
Now, may I ask one quick question here? You said 15% is five years. What's the rest of the? Well, there's 80, to, in order to get 100%, so we have to split the 85% within the next 10 years. The next 10 years. Well, it, let, me, let, me, let me back up a little bit. The five years didn't start until this was signed. So the first five years were good. So, so we have basically 10 years to meet 42, 43% of where we need to be for, the, for that next iteration. Was that part of your um, capital improvement plan? Yes, it is. There are, some, there are some projects in there that are part of the capital improvement plan. The, the, um, the, the challenge is going to be finding viable projects that will treat to the standards that they need to be treated, treat the, the stormwater to the, the standard that needs to be treated using, mod, using the science that's available. Hopefully, as we move forward, science will get better and we'll find different techniques, different methodologies to treat stormwater to, to help clean things up. And that's my city manager report. All right. Well, any, further, <laughs> any further questions for Alan on this report? Okay. Alan, thank you very much. Okay. We did seven. Moving on to agenda number eight. Discuss, take action on information provided by Colin Basinger for permanent city manager. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Basinger is present to discuss information. Um, we are proposing a tentative schedule for the final month of the uh, permanent city manager search. And at this time, it would be appropriate to finalize the dates so that the council can be prepared and provide sufficient time for potential candidates to make arrangements for meetings, et cetera, um, and close as the, as the calendar. It, again, it's, it's tentative. So at this point, we'd, uh, we'd like to, to finalize these dates so that people can make plans. Okay. And Mr. Bayser here to, to discuss the process and ask for any questions. OK. Oh, excuse me. So in any case, we'll have those materials for you tomorrow, possibly Thursday. I think you probably have enough to read for now anyway, so you probably won't miss them for a day or two. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing was, was the dates that uh, your uh, uh, city manager mentioned. Um, we are scheduled to select finalists, and I do want to talk a little bit about the process that I'd recommend you use to select finalists later. Um, on the 12th, or it could be the 11th. I'd like to see if we can move it to the 11th. I'll be out of town on the 12th. Anybody have problems with the 11th? Sorry. Is, is, is that League of Cities Day? Yes, I've already contacted the Nords if it was changed that we would not be going to the League of Cities. Okay. And, and one, one thing I might add is this normally takes like 15 to 20 minutes, no more than half an hour. So and you, depending on we what time we schedule a meeting, you might be able to go to the League of Cities. I don't know what that schedule is. First of all, is the 11th just to change that date? Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll do the 11th then. Okay. And then we have the interviews. Well, the reception scheduled for the 15th and interviews scheduled on the 16th. <coughs> Normally, in the interviews on the 16th, we have one-on-one -on -one interviews in the morning and then a full council interview in the afternoon. So you'll speed dating in the morning, so to speak, 40 minutes each. And then in the afternoon, it's a, a, a full council meeting. So you get to see them. And then the reception the night before, so you get to see them in the three settings, the social, the we'll test the chemistry, the one-on-one, -on -one, and then the full council. Suit everybody. 16th, I am on call for that whole weekend. So on, an on call means I'm going to be out and about. So I, it's very, very unlikely I'm going to be here. But I can go ahead and you can go without me is all you can do, and I can get what I can on the 15th and then buy my readings. That's all we can do. Well, the other thing I can suggest, too, is that we might be able to set up interviews at different times for you. 
I, I never know. I mean, yeah. My my coverage goes from Mims to, to Vero Beach, so I never know where I'm going to be. <laughs> so. Telephone interviews would that work? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll work out. Okay. That. It's important yeah. that you you know you have the opportunity. Okay. So, so the 16th being the Saturday is the one on one. Does that meet everybody else's time schedule? Yeah, I'm not crazy about that 8.45 a.m., but... <laughs> we can move it back a little bit if you like. I mean... Does that date work for everyone? Yeah, I don't like the morning thing. Well, but the date works, correct? What time would you like to start? I can always change... That's probably this. not a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit of a night owl myself, we'll so I don't... Out. <laughs> That's a good date. So the 16th, we're on. Okay. And then the, the, the other... The, the one thing I would recommend... Um, on the 16th is when you schedule your meeting for the, the afternoon where you're doing your full council interviews, you may want to schedule that as a special meeting just in case at that point you're ready to make a decision on who your city manager is. Somebody, I, I recommend, frankly, that you sleep on it, but sometimes councils are blown away by one particular candidate and they all get together and say, yeah, we want to hire this person. So I would recommend that schedule as a special meeting. but. The next step is, well, when do we make the selection? Now, I have to tell you, um, I am tie up on the 18th and 19th. Uh, I can send somebody to represent me who's done this before and actually make the decision if that's the night you want to do this. Looking at the schedule for the March 20th council, it's pretty full. It's very full. And I, I would personally like to have a meeting because the city manager is very important. I like to have a meeting on that, and not tie it in with the council myself. So, again, I just they work for me. I just want to make sure that I think the twentieth is is full of the council, and I just believe we need to have a special meeting. Twenty-first is great. Is it work? So, for me. What about the seventeenth? Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not you're not available then. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, and you're tied up the 18th and 19th. Yes, I'm afraid we would like you to be about. here. Um, so the 21st fits everyone's schedule. Councilman yeah. Dean. Yeah. Fine. Okay. And that's assuming that we don't make a decision at the special meeting on the 16th. That's correct. Okay. Uh, the next question is, and I just want to, this is more of a housekeeping matter than anything else. Typically, cities will pay for the candidates to come and actually interview. So if somebody's coming from out of town, that would mean picking up their airfare. Um, just want to make sure we're clear on that, if, if that's acceptable. I mean, if you want the candidates to come, that's probably what you're going to need to do. Uh, and then the second question would be is, do you want the spouses to come? And if so, you know, would you be picking up the airfare too? Now, they, all, they all might be local candidates, so there might be no airfare, but... This, this topic was brought up before, I think, by Councilman Montanero. I think it's important that we, we pay for them to come up. We've selected, narrowed it down to three or five. It's an important decision. And I also would like to meet the spouses for significant others if they have them, because they're going to be moving into this community. Uh, eventually, but they're not already here. Did we have any money budgeted for this process other than in our contract with for Colin? The, for the salaries, there there is a little bit more money. There was a little bit more money, that, but the delta is small. So really, it's going to depend on how many people and and what kind of airfare and all, and, and that kind of thing. But it, it's it's the, the delta between the, the 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 savings from the salaries and the and the. Uh, cost of the search is, is not a great number. But well, we still have the funds, even if it happened to have to come out of reserve. Oh, sure. But I mean, yeah. this is, a, I think, a, an incredible, very critical time. I mean, and if that's the professional way and the way it's being done, I know we don't like Skyping in and stuff of that nature. We want to see the person. So this is what we, you're suggesting this is what we do. Yes, and, and I would also add, chances are you're going to have three or maybe four candidates from Florida. You may have one or two that are going to fly in. The amount of money is probably not that great. And, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Medina mentioned this before, and it was a, it was a very good point. There's $20,000 for the beachcaster. 
uh, by the time a new city manager is selected, they come in, they get up to speed, and they start working on the beach caster and start to do it. You're only talking about a few months left in the year. I'm not sure it would be even possible to spend twenty thousand dollars on the beach caster in a few months, and that's if you did it. You did a, 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 a mailing every month, so I suspect that there's probably some some money there that can that can be used for this process. Council wishes. Agree. Yeah. Support it. Support it. Okay. Okay, and then the last thing is I'd like kind of like to get you ready for Monday, and how we're, what we're going to do. So I'll hand this out. Martinez that has withdrawn? No, no, it, Martinez is the substitute. Kurt Carver was someone that we had originally put in the mix and he has, he's the one who withdrew. So these names are all correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What we normally ask you to do, and, and this process actually goes fairly quickly, is we'll ask you to pick your top five candidates. If somebody really wants to say six, see six, then I can deal with six. And if somebody says, you know, I can only really find three or four here, then we can deal with that as well. I prefer to have five. And the rationale behind that is that, you know, you can describe what you're looking for and what you think you want. But until you actually see the people, they're all unique. They all have a different set of experience and knowledge, skills, abilities, all that. Until you see those people, you won't really know what who you want, what you're, what you're looking for. I mean, you kind of have an idea, but you won't know until you see the person. I think you have a better chance of seeing that person if you interview five than if you interview three. Um, if you interview four instead of five, I can live with that. I prefer five. Uh, if you get down to three, I'll get uppity uh, because I've had situations where candidates have withdrawn at the last minute. They'll get another job, something will happen, and then all of a sudden you're left with interviewing one or two for your city manager's position, and it puts you in a position where you really don't have much choice. So I would like you to interview at least four, preferably five. The process we use is to ask each of you to pick five candidates. Uh, we just we have a little score sheet uh, that the city clerk normally has, and it just has everybody's name and the candidates' names, and we just total it up. And what typically happens is you'll have three, maybe four candidates that the majority of you want to see. Uh, so there's really not a lot of point in spending a lot of energy and time talking about those because the majority of the council wants to see them. By the same token, since you only have 25 votes among you, there's going to be some candidates that are going to get zero votes or one vote. And that's, be, you know, it's not that they're bad candidates, it's just that in the hierarchy of things, given that you've already, say, spent 15 votes picking your top three or four, uh, three at least, um, you know, there aren't many votes left over. So the position you're in is that usually you'll have three or four that are pretty clearly the majority wants to see, they have two or three that nobody wants to see or very few want to see, and then there'll be one candidate maybe or two that have two votes, and then you um, have to figure out how you're going to decide who number five is. Uh, sometimes it'll be kind of obvious. Sometimes the, the council votes again. Sometimes one of the council members will say, you know, I really want to see Fred, or I really want to see Sally, and the other council members will say, okay, let's bring Fred or Sally in. So that's the process we use. As I said, it's normally fairly quick. Uh, there's typically not a lot of discussion. And I prefer it that way, quite frankly, because you know, you've seen the materials, but all you've seen is paper. And it's really, I don't think, fair to have a lot of discussion about candidates until you've actually met them and had an opportunity to talk to them. Uh, so that's the process we use. And so if you'll be ready next Tuesday with 
So we'll be, it's Monday, correct? Monday. Monday. I'm Monday. sorry. I'm sorry. I will be here Monday, I promise. Okay. Um, You'd like to set a time, 7? Whatever. 7? I know it's easier for him to get here. 7 o'clock on the 11th. I think that's all I have. Okay, so at, at this meeting, we will, we will fill this out and turn it into you. Is that correct? Or? Yep. Okay. And then I'll typically just read the votes out loud and the city clerk can record them. Okay. And I ask each of you to sign it at the bottom to keep the clerk happy, and then I ask each of you to check your name off so sometimes I can't read your handwriting. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, that's I'm going to open it up for public comment and see what we get from there. At this time, I'd like to open up for public comment. Dale Abrams, resident. Is this open to the public? This meeting on Monday? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any further public comment? Here, none. Bring it back to council. Yeah, I think we should make it clear that the reception on the Friday the 15th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Schechter Center is open to the public. So spread the word. Can we look at that timing on that? I know you have a hard time at 5.30. I know I have a hard time sometimes at 5. Can we maybe look at 6 or 6.30 on that, Joe? Yes, sir. Whatever. Okay. We're prepared to adjust as, uh, as you uh, <coughs> uh, Whatever is Okay. Available for you and Mark. You guys are the ones that probably okay. have more time. Yeah, a little later would be helpful. Okay. We'll work so, on that. what time? 6 30. 30. 30. 30. 6 30. Okay. 6 30 to 8. Yeah, fine. So, the time is 6 30 to 8. Okay. Good. See, Cheryl. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Do we want to discuss the time on the 16th now, or there was some issue about the, uh, the early start on the 16th? Yes, I would suggest you do because the, the following, the, the second afternoon is going to be a publicly notice meeting, so we need to know what time that one's going to start. Yes. I mean, I... <laughs> Ten. I'm okay with 8.30, but I know some people are not, so, and that's well, going to take how long? That's about... Yeah, that's not, there's not much room for adjusting this. So. Looking at this you know. Well, you can move the uh, afternoon session to start later, too. Well, we don't have to be awake for these, do we? No. Uh, no. I'm good. Uh, I would also point out that your 1 o'clock full council interviews uh, the candidates. You've got candidate 5 listed twice. I will fix that. Okay. Not a problem. Thank you. Somehow I missed that. I apologize. Okay. Anything else good? Council? Time wise? I know I have to get a the boy to a baseball game at nine, so okay. no. it's a... set. set. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number nine. Discuss, take action on the Bard County Interlock Agreement in a lo local agreement for stormwater education outreach. Yes, sir. This uh, this is being presented because the interlocal agreement changed from Keep Brevard Beautiful to the Brevard Zoo as the administrator, um, thus requiring all the participating cities to re-sign the contract based on that particular change. Uh, the yearly membership is uh, three thousand five hundred eighty-three dollars. This is something that uh, we've been doing for uh, for several years, and again, this like the state attorney agreement and some other things, because of the change in the administrator, is why they're requesting that we re-sign it. But it needs to be a council action, and uh, Public Works Director Alan Potter is here to discuss the program benefits and answer any questions you might have. Good evening again. Um, the Part of the, the, the process that we were talking about earlier, the BMAP process, um, a component of that where we get credit is for public education and outreach. The uh, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, NPDES, who we get our MS4 permit through, which is the type permit we have for our stormwater system, 
also requires that we have some type of uh, public outreach and education. Um, actually, next Thursday, I will be having an audit with those folks uh, to go over the things that we do on a yearly and annual basis to uh, make sure that we're in compliance with the NPDES. And 1A1 of their um, requirements is public education and outreach as a minimum control measure. So um, the program that we are involved with was put together through a, um, a consortium of of cities within the, in the county for um, public education and outreach through a program called Live Blue. The program is is very well run. Uh, initially, it was it was sponsored and administrated by uh, Keeper of Our Beautiful. They have since uh, backed off, and uh, the um, Brevard Zoo has taken taken control of the administrative uh, process. Um, Lisa Good, who basically works through Brevard Zoo to as as the educator in the program, uh, does an outstanding job, and um, we really like to keep involved in this because we, like I said, we, we get credit through for the BMAP, and we also get credit through for our NPDES permit, um, and it's really a requirement. Um, Lisa every year puts out a report um, telling us what she's done, um, what schools she's visited, the type of education that she's put out. She also does adult programs and she's been, uh, had booths at Founders Day and at the Ocean, Ocean Reef in Shore um, thing that was just at Pelican Park. So. I think it's a it's a good program. It starts um, in the elementary schools with with younger kids to you know promote behavior modification as far as you know picking up after your dog and making sure mom and dad wash the car in the grass as opposed to washing in the driveway. And, you know little things like that you can change your daily routine to help clean up the lagoon. So um, that's basically the program what our benefits are through the program, and um, I'll answer any questions. The only thing I wanted to add, Mayor, just to be clear, I'm not sure if it was in the beginning, is this normally would just be a reoccurring every year once we joined. The reason that it's coming back again and not just reoccurring as normal is the change in the administrator. I, I just have one question at the, the $3,500. Was that budgeted? Was that in the but a line item in the budget? Sure. Okay. I was it a specific line item? It, it came on stormwater utility, and that's where it comes from. And that's where it came from the past. That's what comes from the past. I'll make a motion to approve continued participation in the public education and outreach program, approve a payment of $3,583 for <coughs> education services from Satellite Beach Community Functions and Elementary Schools. The money will be coming from the stormwater fund. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Vice Mayor Bryan. Further discussion on Council? Yeah, I'm surprised. Um, in the original agreement that we signed, it uh, said that um, Keeper Bar Beautiful was the administrator, and this letter that we've got from Virginia Barker informs us that uh, it is now Brevard Zoo, and it says to make this change, the interlocal agreement needs to be amended, and yet there's no reference to the new administrator in the amendment that we are being um, asked to look at. So, just a comment. Um. I will call Virginia tomorrow and and point yeah. that out to her. I'd ask if that should be in there. And where it would be is um, um, under witnesseth number two contract. I would think the wording would be the, co the county shall contract with Brevard Zoo to provide administration. Want to amend the motion for it? I'll amend, I'll amend the motion to uh, 
ask the county to include that language in the uh, in the contract clause in number two. I'll amend the second. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion from council? Now, what do you think your motion is? The motion is to approve it, and hopefully you'll put in and add them. Add that one in the, the contract. Okay, you got that, Lenore. I, I do have one more question on the back. It said list of invoices, and it's kind of cut off, but it has the invoice for last 2012 of $884.50. Did the, did the cost go up for our contribution? And then it has a reincurring invoice from Brevard County for Satellite Beach, rather, to Brevard County Natural Resources? Not that I know of. I don't. I, all I know is what we paid last year and this year. I don't. I don't have the. So it's all. It's always been two, three. Yeah. Years. Yeah. I think so it's June and July, right? There yeah. I think that's. Okay. It's, that's a total yearly. July. So July through September. If I remember correctly, it was paid quarterly, quarterly? And monthly. Okay. And now, now they now they want it yearly. That's why. But it adds up to the same from what okay. the finance. Okay. That makes sense. Then. Any further discussion? Open up for public comment. I noticed in the um, city manager's comments that um, Beachside Democratic Club was cited as one of the groups that um, a big blue, I'm sorry, Joanne Regan resident, that um, Liv Blue made their presentation to, and I ha I'm on the board of um, Beachside Democrats, and she did come, and she it was very informative, and we enjoyed it so much, we asked her to come back a second time, and she came back another time and showed a film, and she gave out a lot of information, and I have seen her out at um, downtown Melbourne at um, Friday Fest, and I've seen her when um, there was uh, a... Um, the art festival, she had a table set up in the, um, the area where the parking garage is for City Hall. And I've seen her, at, you know, pretty much whenever there's a festival, she's there um, giving out information and passing out literature and, you know, doing what you may not know that she's doing if you don't go to festivals a lot. But um, I think you're getting your money's worth. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? On this agenda item, hearing none, bring back to council. Council, any more discussion? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. 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 Motion passes five nothing. Um, moving on. At this time, I'd like to um, council permission go to agenda item number twelve. Sure. Uh, discuss, take action on resolution number nine twenty six. Carry. Um, at an earlier meeting with City Council, the Recreation Board had um, provided some resolution changes that they, for Council's review, um, unfortunately I wasn't here to um, kind of help the process. Um, it was understood by me that Council asked for staff to go back um, with the resolution and bring it back to Council in smaller segments with some background and some um, rationale as to why the changes were being proposed by the Recreation Board. So uh, the Recreation Board will be doing that over the next several meetings. This evening, we would be looking at only a few changes to the resolution um, to address some of the concerns that were brought up at the first meeting. Um, one of those uh, was the restriction for religious ceremonies. Uh, that one has been, for Mr. Beadle, that has been eliminated. <clears throat> um, the second one was uh, DAV exemptions. That one's been taken out until it can be reworded to um, properly include more than just one of our veterans associations. The exemptions for um, school use was reworded by Mr. Beadle. Um, the last thing that's been changed on there, and that was per my request, the um, skate park has, um, has in the past, well, you know how we can cycle it, but in the last couple months, it has had um, a, a drastic reduction in participation. Um, I'm proposing, as with the Recreation Board also, to reduce those fees so we can get more kids at that skate park. Um, right now, um, a month ago, we were having four kids skate every night. I was bringing in somewhere between $9.50 and $14, um, paying somebody to sit there for five hours. 
if we can reduce the fees to $2 per kid, I should be able to get 10, 20 kids in there a night. Um, we'd be making more money and bringing more kids in. Um, skating is a lot like baseball. It's not a whole lot of fun when three people are throwing a ball around. <laughs> it's not a whole lot of fun when two or three kids are skating. It's a lot of fun when there's a lot of kids skating. So that's what we propose to do um, with the Recreation Board. Okay. Thank you, Council. Those questions here. Uh, no, but I did talk to uh, City Manager and uh, the Attorney earlier about abstaining from voting on this because my son does uh, use the skate park. In fact, it's probably one of the, it is one of the only things that our family does. And, and uh, Mr. Beadle said that um, there's a statutory requirement that I participate in the. Uh, discussion and also vote, but I wanted to put it on the record that this was not initiated by me to reduce the cost. It was something initiated by the Recreation Department. Me. Me. Um, so, Carrie, on page seven, are these um, fees for the skate park look to me to be the same that were in that uh, other uh, resolution that we sent back? Yes, ma'am. So, so, how is this lower? The other, yeah, the other one also was already had already included the recommended changes. Lowered. Lowered. Okay. So um, the only two changes in um, on page seven, section eighteen, the regular skate sessions have been uh, recommended to go to two dollars from three dollars and fifty cents. Okay. And the punch card only made sense to adjust the number of skates, otherwise you'd be paying more for a punch card than per session. Okay. So those are the only two changes on the. Uh, skate park fees. Okay. Um, you know, a way that you can handle the disabled, uh, the DAV issue, disabled veterans, is just instead of naming disabled American veterans, just say disabled veterans associations or organizations. Uh, I think it would be nice to include that now. Um, I can recommend to the Recreation Board we meet um, next week. Um, I'm going to get from them what sections they want to go forward with next, and we'll include that also in one of the. Okay, and for the dog park, mm -hmm. um, if you'll look at um, the very last paragraph under skate park, I'm wondering if that should also be the last paragraph under dog park. The memberships. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is the same, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. So uh, mm -hmm. I would include that in both places. <coughs> so then the only change that we are making is the addition of that, those two sentences at the end of Dog Park. Is that correct? So. Okay, then we um, move. We approve resolution 926 as amended. We need to read another. Yeah? We need to read another. Oh, okay. I, have, I have a question on Sherry. On the um, family, how many family memberships do you have? One. One. I think I think they're very expensive. Yeah, I, um, but at, at the time that we started our skate park, we were the only municipal skate park in, in a large area. Um, we chose fees that were realistic for a recreation community type of facility. They're still, they were still twice as high as what a kid could play tennis. They're four times as high as what a kid could play baseball. So, um, but most of the private areas were $8 a session, so we kind of chose three fifty. Now all of those people have dropped down to much lower than 8 and we're still at three fifty. But, um, but those fees, those membership fees, were um, um, right along in line with what everybody else was doing back when we opened up in 98. Okay. I just wonder if there's no one using them, why we have, you know, do we need uh, to have the uh, family membership? Well, we also didn't have many kids at the park either, so maybe right. once we lower the fees, the membership will be more. And Mr. Mayor, that is the process that they will be going forward is taking, you know, they want the, the, the immediate change of the skate park piece and to remove the language from the attorney uh, right now and then as she had mentioned, they're going to go back and look at each section and as they as they do regularly every couple of years and see if it's in line with everybody else and, and then take those sections uh, as they come and we'll incorporate those changes that have been mentioned for consideration. Thank you. Can we read by title please? 
Resolution number 926, <clears throat> the resolution of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, establishing policies, procedures, and fee schedules for use of satellite beach facilities, repealing resolutions, resolution numbers 543, 559, 572, 698, 725, 744, 749, 756, 786, 843, 862, 873, and 915, providing an effective date. So reading of resolution number 926. Thank you. Motion to approve resolution number 926. Second. As amended. As amended, as amended yes. As amended, okay. yes. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Brimer, second by Councilman Montanero. At this time, I'd like to open it for public comment. Steve. Steve Headley, resident. Turn with me, with, with me, if you will, to section 32, which reads, permission to use the facilities will be denied to any private or non-public, non-profit group charging permission or passing the hat unless prior city manager permission has been granted. When I first read that, I thought of an offering at a church. That's what passing the hat is. Therefore, you're interfering with a religious activity for which the city has no legitimate interest in. I think that's a problem in that. Secondly, the um, recent Supreme Court case of Citizens United said that people have the right to donate money and give money and pay money where they wish to. This part of the resolution is basically saying that the city controls where you can give your money to. Not where you can give your money, but if you're going to do an activity because paying for an admission is something that is a tangible benefit. And therefore, that isn't that part of the problem is. That's part of the, the second half. But overall, I view this this regulation as even in its 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 present form, even if I were to sit there and say, we're going to allow offerings, we're going to allow people to do whatever. The resolution itself has people makes people question what they are going to do, what they are going to say, and therefore has what would be, I would deem to be a chilling effect on free speech, free association, and free assembly. And therefore, I humbly submit that this section be eliminated. I can see of no benefit for it. I, I, there's, no, there's no criteria given in the resolution, and I understand sort of why that is upon that which the city manager would make a decision. And I don't like that, and I don't think city managers like going, we're going to approve this willy-nilly. So that would have to be developed as well. But for those three reasons, the fact that you were limiting a, a, an activity, and even if you were to make an exception and say we're going to allow, allow an offering, you then have the problem of you were allowing a church to pass a hat, but not another group, which gets into the fact that government should not should neither advance nor retard or impede act, a, a religious activity. It shouldn't get no benefit. I'm sorry. I think this section needs to go. And if I've spoken somewhat hesitantly, it's because it's confusing. But I think there are three arguments there, all of them which lead to this, this section being wiped off the book. Thank you, Steve. Any further public comment? Hearing none, back to Council. Jim, any comment on that one section, please? I'll be honest, I didn't look at this one. I looked at the ones that Mr. Headley previously brought up. Um, I don't know. I mean, when you're looking at issues, you're looking at as applied and and um, and on its face or facial attacks. And I mean, basically, what the city's 
prohibiting our people from charging admission when they're utilizing the facility. Um, the, the city as a property owner has a right to control how its property is being utilized and the city it would seem would be allowed to tell people that are going to use the facilities that they can't charge admission for use of their facilities. Um, you know, I've been blindsided, but you know, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know that on its face that there's a problem with this. As applied, there may be a problem, but on its face, I've never heard anyone attack a provision like this before. Not that they haven't. Why, why I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would just say, you know, for the council to go ahead and adopt it, and if, if you know, if I look at it and figure out that there's something wrong, we can take it out. I mean, I don't know that this has been an issue in the past, so I don't know that it needs to be addressed tonight. Why don't we just say that we won't charge? They can't charge admission and clean it up, rather than well, uh, well. Uh, or Mr. Headley, that. Mr. Headley is attacking or is suggesting an attack on the on the provision, much broader than that, mm -hmm. and that's you know, and I'd rather, if you know, either this is going to stand, going to stand, or it's not going to stand, and you know, the city's never had an issue with it as far as I know, um, so I'd like to be able to have the opportunity to look at this issue if you know. If, if council doesn't see a problem with it, they can move to eliminate the whole thing entirely. But um, but if, if council what? wishes to have something similar to this in here, I would just recommend adopting the resolution as it stands right now and allow me to look and see whether or not there is an issue regarding these types of provisions. Yes, I'd like to simplify it and let you look at something else and just say permission to use the facilities will be denied to any group charging admission, period. Carrie, do you have? My, my concern with that be is a um, um, perfect example is we have project graduation that's coming in to do theirs. They charge admission, people buy tickets, and it goes to a good cause. We also have Lifeline that comes in. It's kind of a private business, but for 50 bucks or something, you can get a health screening. It's a good cause. Um, we have had people come in and ask to use a rental facility at $14 an hour, and they want to sell a $100 ticket. No, I don't, I don't think okay. you need to be renting a city building okay. for inexpensive and make a whole lot of money off of it. Then let's leave it and have the attorney. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is it critical that we do it tonight or postpone it till? the 20th and let the attorney look at so we do it right once. That's, that's fine if Jim wants to proceed that way. That's, a, that's what council wants to do. That's fine. So carries that seat. Yes, and the recreation right. board will have had a chance to look at it too by then. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. No action. Okay. No action. I think you need to withdraw the motion on the second. Oh, draw. Okay, I'll take a few seconds. Okay, I make a motion. Uh, I'll take back the second. Okay. Withdraw the second. Okay. okay, at this time I'll take agenda item number 11, discuss, take action on vacation of Beach Street right away. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, attach your fine for residents requesting a vacation on a portion of the Beach Street right away, and also uh, the city clerk. Uh, we received an email uh, this morning about this particular uh, agenda item, and uh, I believe the city clerk has copies for everybody who came in this morning. And uh, did you have a chance to make those? Okay. Good. Thank you. And also, the uh, I believe some are. Almost all, I think, of the uh, residents are here to uh, discuss their position. Also, Mr. Mayor, I um, did some research on this, and I have some information I'd like to pass out to you. Um, I'm 
morning, uh, providing the uh, city clerk with, with copies of this. Um, there's actually additional copies that I'm providing to the city clerk that she can provide the council and the city attorney with later. But um, I went through what transpired in the past, and it had always been the position of the city not to vacate right-of-ways, easements, or public land. And um, the action that took place that vacated that portion of property in the past, um, what I'm doing is I'm recommending that no action be taken on this agenda item tonight. Um, if you look back the public was not given proper notice to speak at the meetings. Public hearings must, by Florida statute, um, provide 14 days prior to an agenda item be on the agenda. That did not happen. Um, also, 30 days after the acceptance, um, there's also supposed to be a public notice according to Florida statute. That did not happen. So I am asking that the city attorney look at this information and come back with a determination on whether or not the vacation of the, that Beach Street right-of-way was even legal. Um, are we ready? Yep. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, I and Jim was at these meetings when this vacation was right away. It, the, the, the folks involved here have petitioned the city to vacate a portion of the right-of-way. They, they have, we don't have a process in place. The process has been presented, or actually I have documentation here that the City Council recommended that a process be put in place last year. It was never done. It was never brought back to the City Council and never put in the land development regulations. As far as I'm concerned, and, and Jim, you, you can go further, everything was done legally when this vacation of the Beach Drive, the, the, the portion that you're talking about, was done legally. Um, just you know, and, and, and this is really kind of off what we're, what the agenda item is, but I'm going to talk about the beach, the gorge property. Uh, they, they petitioned the city in May of last year. Um, everyone says that this issue was, um, the decision was made in haste, and that's not true. Um, the city did have a process in place at the time. They put, they put a petition to request the vacation. It came before the city council on July 18th. There was a lot of discussion about it. The public was allowed to speak at that meeting. Uh, Mr. Beadle and the building department were, were involved with the process, and we went over the process to make sure it was done properly. Um, and then the, uh, at, that, at, that, at that time, we, we thought that the item should go to the CRA for approval. And then it was determined that it was a non-issue. So it was removed from the agenda. That's why no public comment was taken in at that meeting. Not because they were denied the opportunity to speak, because there was a, it was a non-issue and it was never an, it, it was removed from the agenda. Um, I believe that we are duty bound to look at these right of ways um, individually, not in one lump group, and make decisions on them. Residents have petitioned the city, and we are duty bound to make a decision. Um, it's unfortunate that there is no process in place. There is uh, tons of documentation. If you want, I can read it or I can put these documents into the record where we can. We had asked staff to proceed with putting a process in place last year, last May, and it hasn't been done. That is no fault of the previous city council. And uh, th this is a paper right away that hasn't been used in years, and I think these ap applications need to be reviewed individually and a decision needs to be made by the city council on each one of them. It, it doesn't matter whether there was a policy in place. Florida statute. 336.1 states how you go about vacating public property, how you public notice it, and how you put it on I, agendas. Then I would like and that question that answered by Mr. Riedel. Did and we I'm follow the Florida statute? That was done. I've researched it. Lenore has time, all the please. information. This is a legal issue. Mr. Riedel, I'd like to, you to answer that question whether or not in the past the city had followed that process. I think we have two, two issues. issues here. We have one that was already done. That's not what agenda item number 11 is asking for. I know, but, um, but before Please. we go down that road, we need to make sure that, number one, it's always been a longstanding tradition that we have not vacated those. And I don't want to see us move forward making any decisions on vacating any parcels of property, 
knowing that this one was handled wrong. Okay. First, uh, agenda item number 11 is those residents located at the addresses in our packet. About the right of, their right away, not the other right away. So uh, I think we have to handle that situation on that agenda item because that's what the agenda item is. The other one, Jim, comment on that or we take that up at another another meeting. We put it on the next agenda. I mean I can I can base it on my recollection, but um, I mean, my recollection of Chapter 336 relates to the county commission, not the cities. My recollection from looking at the stuff before was is there's no process specifically delineated in the statutes that address how a city vacates public property. That's my recollection of what the research but there was are, at the time. But there, are, there, are, there is language in there that states how the public is noticed. How for, for county vacations. Not for city. That's not the way I read it. No, that, statute. no, that's we have to read the, that section of the statute in the context of the chapter of the statutes it's in. Well, chapter I, Chapter three thirty six. Again, my recollection is relates to vacations by the by counties, and county roads, not it, it municipal still, it roads. It still was never publicly noticed. It was never an agenda item. It was not a resolution on an agenda item. If you go back and look at the agendas, but they're all in the packet I gave you. Okay. There. Okay. I mean, my recollection was it was the, done I, by resolution, but I may be wrong. I, I think there are two issues, and, and I there would is prefer two. We that. have one. Yeah. Jim. Right, right now, that's on yeah. for agenda item. If we want, as a council, to Jim to look at the past, mm -hmm. then from consensus, we'll give him that direction. But we still have agenda item number eleven here that we have to deal with. Correct. Is that a Regarding what Jim, I mean, I, Dominic, this is, you know, the paragraphs are pretty well laid out here. Um, regarding direction to, to Attorney Beadle, I think it's pretty clear in this document what Councilman Montanero's concerns are, and they, if they are valid, um, we'll have to move forward with that. But I would, I would specifically request that Mr. Beadle take a look at what he's presented and, and really review that. I think it's, I think these are fairly serious. Whether they're accurate or not, they at least need to be given their due consideration. Yes. Yes. Correction, Council. Council Medina. Yes. Chair. Okay. Jim, if you could please have to give us a report on that one. Okay. Back to agenda item number eleven. Council discussion. Well, again, I think that because there are four separate petitioners, uh, each each uh, petition needs to be looked at separately, not in one uh, lump. Um, again, I'll defer to Mr. Beadle, but I think that's the proper way to do this. Um, if we're not looking at the city hasn't decided to vacate the entire right of way, um, each property owner has come to us requesting that a certain portion be vacated, and I think they need, they need to these petitions need to be looked at. Um, individually, and um, whether we choose to do that this evening or have the pe and agenda items agenda items done separately, uh, so it's very clear and concise what we are looking at. Um, that's up to the will of this um, council. Okay. Well, if we're going to go <clears throat> individually, then my answer would be no, 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 and no. The tradition, the history, the policy of this city is to stop vacating um, easements, public rights of way um, along or near the waterways. Our city has had um, lessons learned from the years when things were pretty freely vacated. Uh, you cannot know today what may come along. Uh, that will require a public right-of-way, and I am not in favor of changing the city's long-standing policy about vacating public rights-of-way. That those rights-of-way belong to the public. When those properties are purchased, they are clearly indicated as having a public right-of-way on them. Um, so it, it's not a surprise, or it shouldn't be a surprise, 
um, and I am not in favor. I think it was a huge mistake to vacate last year, and and it may even be um, improper the way it was done, and I'm not willing to continue vacating public rights of way. Further, I, I feel the same, and I've stated that in the beginning of my discussion tonight. Well, I, I, I understand we have had a long-standing tradition, but the law is the law, and we don't have a process in place to deal with deal with these issues. This issue was brought to us just a few weeks ago, and we took no action, no action to put a policy in place. So shame on us. And I said, I said the same thing last year when the first vacation was brought to us. Shame on us for not having a policy and procedure in place. If it's been a long-standing tradition, why didn't the formal council put a policy in, in place to deal with these and criteria to deal with them? Um, I say yes, yes, yes on the vacations then. And, and again, shame on us. If, and, and again, it's in the record from May where we requested that the staff create or do an amendment to the land development regulations regarding vacations of right-of-ways. Whether it's a tradition or not, there needs to be a policy in place, and there is none. And so I think that um, these, right ha these folks have a right to petition um, the city council, and they have a right to be heard. Thank you. Um, I was down there along that area today as I try to go to any area that we're going to take a look at doing this and spent some time just looking at the area. Um, I don't favor vacating these easements at all. I'm sorry. I just I, I looked at it. I think the property is, is what it is, but I do not think the city should vacate this property. Yes, Okay. Um, this time, let me open it up to the, the residents who are petitioning us if they would like to speak. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dion Clark, and I'm one of the townhome owners at 1697. Um, that sits directly west of the property that was vacated in August. Uh, we've also presented to you my brother and law partner the um, position paper that I think you all have a copy of. If not, I have others. But um, he's written this, and his interest is that he owns the common property of the four-unit townhome. So his interest is directly affected because his piece of property directly abuts the piece you've vacated and those you've received application for. Um, we did make application based on the recommendation of the City Council in August to vacate that easement, the one that sits right at the beach access, which is also behind the four unit complex. Um, but I only did that as an alternative because I agree with um, Councilman Montanaro. I think it was absolutely illegal and absolutely wrong to vacate the parcel that in August. I have three reasons why. Um, they're outlined in that position paper. If you'll allow me two minutes, I'll just briefly highlight them. Um, the first one, and uh, it's legally outlined here, but um, the council's prior action to vacate that section was via a resolution and not an ordinance. Um, we've got the statute there that states that it has to be by ordinance if there isn't, as Ms. Deenan said, a procedure in place by the city. Um, this error in this case invites litigation because of that. Um, the, the reason is, and I think, again, he highlighted that, is the resolution is nothing more than an attempt at lessening and reducing, reducing the requirements that are set out by statute. Vacating by resolution violates Florida statute and offends the due process requirements. The second issue is personal, and um, with all due respect, you'll forgive me for bringing this up, but the little bit of research I've done because of how this directly affected my property and its value shows some impropriety uh, of two council members at the time, one that should have recused himself, Councilman uh, Rhodes, I believe, that I found did some work for Ms. Gorsh at her property, and then um, also by Ms. Deenan. This, too, invites litigation, and I think it should be avoided. The, the third issue I have there is I think 
what's going to become if we continue to vacate these properties and other in the city is the harm that's done. You'll notice if you go by the property, Ms. Gorsh has mowed down, and I have pictures of it, mowed down sea oats. Um, there's all kinds of tracks through the rest of the easement property there. Um, she has tried to rehabilitate that a bit. I spoke with um, Wesley Sitch. He's a specialist at the Department of Environmental Protection. And he said in no way, shape, or form was she allowed to do that. But he didn't have the resources to address it. And given that I am an attorney, he invited us to do that. I'm trying to avoid that litigation. I don't think that ever does anybody any good. Um, but uh, in addition to that, there was a fence erected. And the offense also doesn't comply with code because there's some confusion as is this beachfront property now, is it not? So the fence isn't slatted. That interrupts the breezeway. And now there's all kinds of concerns about should the fence come down? Is it proper? Because nobody really knows there was no procedure in place. I don't think it was anybody's intent, but there just was not careful consideration. So I would ask. First, that you uh, consider maybe repeal the past vacation in the alternative that you grant my application. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other applicant would like to speak, please? <clears throat> my name is Robert Bartram. I live at 1683A1A. I live in this, oh, by the way, good evening. Oh, my God. I've lived in the city 20 years in two different sections, uh, seven years during the NASA Moon Program, and I've lived here since uh, June of 2000 this time. I have contributed as a volunteer to the police department approximately, well, what should we say, over 200, 300 hours each year for the last 10 or 11 years. I do rope to with all this. I've done considerable volunteering for the city. I have contributed over $70,000 to the operation and maintenance of this city in the last 11 years. I would very much wish you would consider all of these good things and trying to determine whether or not I should get my little piece of Beach Street again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Wayne Lunsford. I live at 1605. Um, let me start this down. This game. And this is a drawing pretty much to scale about where Beach Street actually is. My house is the one on the end next to the hill. You said, sir, 1655? Yes. Thank you. Beach Street is well named. It's out on the beach. A little bit of it in the dune, but behind my house, it's mostly the beach. Uh, it does present a little bit of a problem when, the, when, when you try and sell a house to try and explain something going through there. Well, you can't really do anything with it. City can't build there. You can't build there. You can't do anything there because it's in the uh, it, it's on the other side of the line. It, the city will never build anything there. They won't build a program. They won't build anything else because they can't. So a lot of this is fairly moot. Uh, I'd also like to address something that Mr. Fergus put out in his little white paper accusing uh, the previous city council of being derelict in their duty and giving away $80,000 plus of uh, tax revenue when they gave this away because it worth $16.17 a square foot. Anybody here want to buy my little section out there, uh, uh, lot B1? Uh, one? I'll, I'll sell it to you a lot cheaper than $16 a square foot. It, 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 it's really kind of ridiculous, and uh, I thought it was impugning the council, previous council's credibility and, and uh, their honest honor when they 
<laughs> I said that. So that kind of offended me. Uh, he also he said there's no there's uh, no legal expectation. Well, um, it's never been used. I, I'm not sure if it was originally plotted that way. If there was anything said because I wasn't here for it and I don't have access to that. Uh, but when Satellite Beach did this first one, it pretty much indicates an abandonment of their right. Uh, you know, the average homeowner anymore uh, doesn't have to work, fear the government will let him down. They, they have to worry about the government stoning him down. Um, It was approved. The, the previous one was approved unanimously. There, I was here for that. There was discussion, and I remember Mr. Ferguson spoke against it, and I don't remember anybody else speaking against it. It was pretty unanimous by everybody that this is something that can't be used, won't be used, and, and why should it be kept there? Um, this, this is from... The satellite Beach LDR. I was here when uh, they passed this also, Section 30-733 for unarm unarmored shoreline. It says in both protection zones, the owner of the property containing an unarmored shoreline embankment shall stabilize it with coastal or estuarine shoreline native vegetation to hold the soil and protect the embankment. It's the city's responsibility to come out and fix my dune out there. Because it's not my doing, it's yours. Now, I've been out policing it quite often, picking trash up that the, either the citizens of Satellite Beach or the people who come and visit the Magellan crossover decide they'd rather throw out there than, than pick it up. But I guess what I should be doing is calling Alan into Public Works and saying, hey, you got trash all over your city property. Would you come out and pick it up? I... I and uh, Mr. Loiza next door to me put at our own cost and with the city's permission over $3,000 each in, in sand to try and stabilize things after the hurricane, which basically was on city property because that's where the beach street is, where we put the sand, trying to protect our homes, which I guess Satellite Beach recently has said that uh, aren't worth protecting because they just as soon see them wash out into the sea, even though they provide a heck of a lot of tax revenue, which doesn't seem to be important. It's just when we're looking for revenue to pay for something, say, well, where are we going to get it? We pay a lot of taxes. We're interested in what happens out there. That's why I have been cleaning up other people's trash, why I've been spending money on plants to, to stabilize the dune, why I've run water out there to water the plants, because I care about it. And some of it, obviously, according to this, is the city's responsibility and they're shirking it. So if you're not going to take care of the property, then it certainly seems like you ought to give it up. Um, I guess it's pretty much all I had to say, except I'd like to quote the wife of our former senator and representative from Florida, Claude, Pre Pe Pre excuse me, Claude Pepper, who said, the mistake a lot of politicians make is forgetting they've been elected and thinking they've been anointed. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to correct a statement that was made. Um, the city has never taken the position that homes can just wash away. The city always has a policy of trying to protect our residents and their properties to the extent possible. Good evening. My name is Tony Lawrence. I'm also a resident in one of the, one of the four homes in question. And, um, you know, I can, I can understand what you're talking about vacating property that nobody wants to give up something. But we, you know, you have to understand what we're looking at here. We're looking at it, the, the residents of that property. I own up to this point where my house is, and then there's a there's a there's an easement, a road road easement. For, and then I own the property on the other side. The city doesn't own that. I mean, that's this is my property here and here. 
This is what we're talking about right in the middle. It goes nowhere. We did vacate one end of it, and next to Mr. Lunch's house, it's the, it's the ocean. There, it, it's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. And it's all it does is amount for the homeowners as clear title, so you don't have to explain you have an easement. I went through this a number of years ago when I was living inland in the city. I had a navigable waterway running through the back of my house in the middle of the city block. There was no water with, within a half mile. But because years ago somebody decided they might want to build a canal through that area, there was, it was put up there. Well, I've been told that this has been over 50 years that this property has been there, and it's never been, it's never been used, it's never been uh, had a road put on it. And according to what I was told, that the law says that after 50 years, if you don't do something with it, you give up your right to that, that easement. Now, what can you do with it? Like Mr. Lungford said, you can't do anything with it. It's east of the coastal setback. You can't build on it. So what is, it, what, what is it that the city wants there? Is it just to be a thorn in the side of residents? And, I, you know, nobody wants to go back to the, oh, I pay a lot of taxes. Well, I pay a lot of taxes. And if you, you know, if... And I, and, I, and I agree with you. I don't think there's anybody in the city council wants to see houses washed away. But, you know, the beachfront property that we have that, that, that runs from the, you know, the sun on the beach there, that little strip mall up, I mean, there's, that's a huge portion of the tax, the revenue that this city, this city has. And it's, and it's, you know, it's good there for everybody's, you know, better, you know, better. The beaches are fine. Everybody enjoys going to the beach. But they do need to be taken care of. And the city's not doing it. And not that they should do it. There's nothing really there for them to do. But like Mr. Brunson said, you know, we've put in, I put in well over 3000 probably closer to $8,000 in sand and, and, and sea, sea oaks and sea grapes and stuff on the, on the property there over the years. And we're not, we're not asking you to give us anything that's, that's, that's going to cost the city anything. As a matter of fact, you'll profit by it because once you turn it back over to the, the homeowners, we have to pay taxes on it. Now, granted, it's not going to be a lot of taxes, but it's a lot better deal than you get in, in, in other places like we did when we took over the big beach park. And what did we do there? We took it over, and now we're responsible for maintaining it, and there's no revenue involved. Well, at least this way, if you're giving what you are giving up, which is basically 50 feet of sand, it, it, it you know comes with a price tag for us. It's it's our it's our commitment to the community, and it's all it does is make the house you know like I said for, for us, it makes the house clear, you know clear and free, the title's free. And going back to what was uh, councilman said earlier, this is this is not something that just all of a sudden came up. I've been I've been stalled by the city since August of last year when I first approached on this day. We're coming up with a policy. We're coming up with a policy. Or, oh, the city's going to try and make money off you now. They're going to try and work it out some way. You're going to have to pay to have this done. That, that's, that's, that's nonsense. There's, there's, there's no reason for that. You can't, you're not supposed to make laws that are retroactive anyway. So, you, you know, if somebody has a petition in front of you, you got to go by what your rules and regulations and your laws are today. You have, a, you have an attorney right here that, you know, you can talk, talk to that. And also talk to the fact that if you haven't used the road, if you haven't used the easement in over 50 years, you, you basically, you know, abandoned it. And it becomes a, it comes the property of, the, of the, 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 uh, the person who owns the property. I mean, you know, it's good to sit up there saying no, 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 but let's be realistic. You know, we're not talking about a piece of highway down the middle of A1A. We're not talking about, you know, a, a road that runs, you know, like the, uh, the park over here where it runs right up to the ocean. This is nothing. This is a piece of land that's stuck between four houses. That's absolutely no use to anybody. Thank you. Any further public comment now? John Hargis, 135 Maple. As to the 50 years of non-use, if one looks at a map, which I presume is still in City Hall, I have scanned it, it shows the 1981 Coastal Construction Control Line. It shows that people obviously were using that piece of right-of-way as a roadway at the time that map was made. It's overlaid on, a map, on an area, and you can see clearly that there was a well-used sand road along that right-of-way at that time. So the clock hasn't started. It's not 50 years old. There is over half an acre of remaining right-of-way. Folks repeatedly talk about stormwater, what is it, uh, collective stormwater management for the CRA. What better place for stormwater management than on the dune. 
The city has done it at Shell Street. They have an exfiltration system there. So there's one immediate possible use for that property. I am sure the people in 1925, when it was platted, had no thought of, they probably didn't even know what exfiltration was at that time. So the point is, no, we don't know what use there might be, and maybe it is as exfiltration. But it is irresponsible for the city to give something up that has been in the public domain for decades. And not only that, but that ill-advised abandonment last year enriched one landowner who has now put up a fence at the expense and probably fiscal cost when they try to sell their property of the people living immediately south. They did a transfer of value on those properties. And this council should not be responsible for continuing that gross error. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Sir, one sir, more sir, sir. Number one. No, excuse me, sir. You had your Want to get opportunity. One time? Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I pay taxes. Thank you. Okay, fine, President. Uh, one quick correction that only one person opposed this last fiasco of vacating that property. I also opposed it very strongly. I still very strongly oppose any vacation of properties owned by the city. Uh, one thing that brings, comes to my mind is, number one, if you vacate that property, it becomes that individual's property. If I step on it, I'm trespassing. Uh, now, here comes the issue about we're going to vote on one on individually on how we're going to vac vacate those properties. The question is, how are you going to discriminate against the people that you won't vacate for, but are you going to vote for yes for some other ones? How are you going to determine that? Is it going to be value of the property? It, you know, that's going to be up to, up to you guys. I am strongly opposed to vacating any city property in the future. It is our property, it belongs to the public, it belongs to the citizens, and needs not to be turned over to a citizen, just so they can enhance their value, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Roger Goodis, Satellite Beach. Um, we talk about not vacating property, yet on the March 20th agenda is the Sheridan property vacation. That is on the future agenda. And it is right, there's no policies and procedures in place at this time yet. But also, when you look at the residents, the, the structure there, and many of these residents do take care of the doom structure there. There's countless dollars spent by these people there. Um, we even spend close to, gosh, I, I'd pay them to say just on our small piece of property, property close to at least $5,000. Um, in buying CEOs, maintaining it, watering it, ensuring that the dune structure is there, not only for protecting our residences, but also for the beautification of the community. And, and if you perfect those properties, really what you're doing is not only building a tax base, but bringing some goodwill to the community here where these residents do care about what they do there. 
and they are watchful, watchful patrons. We all watch the beaches there 24-7 to ensure that the city is safe and no craziness is going on. Um, please work with the beachside residences. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this agenda item? Steve Hedley, resident. I have bounced back and forth on this more than a ping pong on a, in, you know, Chinese table tennis. There are a couple things that I wish to address. One, I think the idea that we have always done something therefore we should continue to do something, is faulty. I think that the idea that we should, because that way we never grow, we never change. I think the idea that if we do it here, we have to do it there, is an insult to every council member who has ever sat on the dais and had, because they wouldn't be able to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong and only be able to say this is always wrong. There's nothing that's always wrong. There's nothing that's always right. We always make exceptions or whatever. And I think that's a disservice. My problem is this, that you've got people who can't use their lots or can't use the property. And if we're not going to do something, if we haven't done anything with it since 1925, then that should be a sign that we're not looking to do with it. And if we even vacate it, we still have, through eminent domain, the ability to come back in and say, we need this right of way back. We still have the ability to use it for a proper or for whatever you want to do later on down the road. The idea that someone built a fence, whether that fence is legal or not, I don't know. But the idea that someone did, let's assume for a second that it was a legal fence. The, the idea that someone built a legal fence should be even considered in the fact that it might affect someone else's property value is ridiculous. That property owner has a right to do with their property as they will within the law. And if the fence is legal, I'm sorry, what, how it affects other people is not the purview of an open government. It's not what we're here for. We should not be taking into account how one person's legal actions affect another. Now, if you want to say the fence is illegal, that's a different story. But it's not. Or if it's not, we shouldn't take that into account. And that's where my ping pong ball has stopped now. The fact that I trust, trust the city council prior and in the future that they can dis discern when to vacate, when to not vacate, and that they have a vision for the city that goes far beyond we've done this in the past, we've never done this in the past. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comment, citizens comment on this agenda item? Hearing none back to council. I have a question. Dale Abrams, resident, I live on the beach and I welcome all of you to come to my home and look at the beach. We can have a cocktail. How did these people get their walkovers put on if they went over the road? Can somebody answer that? Don't you have to pull permits for that? If Beach Street is there, some of them have walkovers that are going over Beach Street. How did they get permits for that? Thank you. Any further? Any further comment? Any further comment on this agenda item? Here and on back to council. Um, I have a few questions, Mr. Beadle. The resolution versus ordinance. Um, clearly, uh, someone on a petitioner actually <coughs> said that uh, the former city council broke the law basically by not. Uh, vacating the road be it ordinance. We went over that thoroughly. Can you go over the AG's opinion on um, resolution versus versus ordinance and the fact that this uh, former, this vacation was a, a done through resolution? Basically, the Attorney General opinions that you're referring to 
indicated a preference by the Attorney General that it be done by ordinance, but there was nothing in there that said it, there was a requirement that it be done by ordinance. Um, the Obviously, that will be subject to me confirming the statute that Councilman Watnero brought up, but that was the predicate for having it done by resolution. And then, um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask some questions about the fence. Mr. Uh, or Jeff, the, the fence that they're talking about, was, was a permit obtained by the city for that fence? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, okay. Um, that's where I'm going to leave that. So it was permitted by the city. They, they pulled a permit to build a fence. Okay. Um, I take offense at any impropriety, that there was any impropriety on my behalf. Uh, when this this portion of this right away this right away that hasn't been used by the public or, or used uh, for a public pur purpose in many years um, took place last year, um, I'm personally offended. And no, as a matter for the record, I'm not friends with the property owner, <coughs> Mr. Porsche. I, I I do know, and it was discussed at last year's meeting that she had contacted each one of the council members uh, when she petitioned the city uh, to vacate the right away. Um, I feel very strongly that these petitions should be reviewed individually. Um, again, um, Beach Street is a paper right-of-way that hasn't been used for a public purpose in years. It actually crosses the dune and ends up on the beach. I believe Mr. Lumsford has a, a, a reasonable case for the vacation of the right-of-way. I believe um, Loisios have a case for a vacation of the right-of-way, given that they own the property on the east and west side of the right-of-way. Um, I believe that Bartiff has a reasonable request for vacation of the right-of-way, given they own the east portion of the right-of-way and the west portion. And with respect to the, I can't see the lot number, uh, the quadplex, in this case, because the adjoining property is owned by the city and may be developed as a park, there may be a potential for public use of that right-of-way. And again, if these were reviewed on their individual merit, this council would probably decide not to vacate the portion of the right away because we do have an adjoining parcel that is owned by the city and we developed as a park. Um, I don't know what else to say, whether it's tradition or not. The council last year strongly, strongly encouraged, and I'm going to put these minutes in the record, uh, and there's also audio of it, of it for the council or the staff to come back um, with procedures and policies to for, for future petitioners, petitioners to go through this process. They have not done it. Tradition may be tradition, but the law is the law. and um, I just think the process you're finding out just because it's tradition, these folks um, generate a lot of tax revenue for the city. They're good stewards of the community. And I think their petitions need to be heard reasonably, one at a time, and a decision based on the facts. I also believe that as a petitioner, they should be heard and be able to present their evidence longer than five minutes when, when you're petitioning the city on a, on a request like this. Thank you. We did not give them a time limit okay. to make a presentation. Um, well, the, the second gentleman came back to speak and add more information, and he was not allowed to speak. Well, we were in citizens' comments at that point, and he had his opportunity. Um, Jeff, quick question. Um, are we working on the procedures, or did that – What? where is the status of that, Jeff? The uh, city attorney has it right now, and uh, he was working on some issues with uh, the utility providers. and. Uh, Remember correctly, uh, because this was discussed by the City Council just a few weeks ago, putting a policy and procedure in place, put, put, and I believe it was one of the utility companies came forward and said, please notify us, you know, uh, if you're going to vacate it right away, because they may have utilities there. Jim, where are, where are you with this? Are you actively working on it? or? I, I didn't. I'm trying to remember if. The proposed resolution was before council. I don't remember for sure, but I was thinking that it came up in a meeting. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look. I know it's it's ready to come before council. I know that. Yeah, I probably had to. Um, it did not go to council. It was uh, scheduled to go to council. I believe it was uh, the day before uh, is when uh, one of the providers they called and expressed their concern and actually a couple of providers did. So it was a full commitment at that point. 
Okay. okay. No, sorry, sir. Okay. You don't want to I do. I, I'll be more than happy to get it from me afterwards, but we close public comment. Um, I just had an opportunity to review the, and I'm sorry I don't remember your name. Um, the, Clark? Yes. The uh, Meacham and Clark letter. Um, and if you haven't read this, you might want to stop and read this, because this has some fairly serious issues outlined in here, especially under issue number two. Um, and I, 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 for having read this, I would think they're seriously taking a stand on this. And the last letter that, the last note here says, I respectfully request that council revisit the prior resolution approving the vacation, vacation request in a void of judicial review. I'm not supporting vacating any land. And I think that we need to be proactive on this one because it, 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 it is definitely tied to what Councilman Montanero is talking about. Um, so I think we need to take a take a look at this. But I'm, at this time, I'm not supporting any vacation of any properties whatsoever. And I think we need to ask Mr. Beadle to take a serious look at this note and see what needs to be done. Um, I think we've talked this enough. Um, there have been four applications for uh, vacating. And I know that if I owned that property, I would want it vacated too. But someone did mention that we are here for the good of our residents, and that's absolutely true. And our choice is to give um, priority to four people or do what is in the best interest of the city, the residents as a whole. And that's the, the, the choice that I choose. So I make a motion that we deny each of these requests to vacate the uh, rights away and that we ask uh, Attorney Beadle to um, reopen the, um, uh, um, to re-examine the vacating of the uh, one property that was vacated uh, last year. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Gott, second by Councilman Montanero. Um, further discussion? Yeah, I, I, I want to. I just want to make a, a few statements. I think that it's really unfortunate, and I want to apologize to those property owners, those uh, property owners that have petitioned the city. Seems to me that the city just really never wants to adapt to the times. They just, it's a tradition. Uh, it's our long-standing policy. The reality is this: this right of way, or at least the northern por portion of this right of way along lots eight. I can't see the number I wrote over it, all the way up to Magellan. It's a paper right-of-way that serves no public use, no public use. So when you're talking about the best interest of the community, I'm not sure there is a best interest of the community here. Um, the best thing to do would be to vacate at least those lots north of Lot A because the public right-of-way has not been used as a public right-of-way in many years, and it serves no public use. I, I just want to say a few things. The property that you all bought, you knew that that was there. And, you know, when you talk about selling your property, you're, somebody's going to buy it the same way that you bought it. And I will tell you this, the city has gone out of their way to help you get sand. I drove to Jacksonville and went to a meeting at the Army Corps of Engineers, and John Fergus went with me initially when the whole process of beach renourishment started. And it was probably in 2002 or 2003. So I won't sit here and listen to people say the city has done nothing. We put sand on the beaches there. We've been instrumental in working with Virginia Barker from Brevard County and Ernie Brown and Mike McGarrity to get sand on your beaches. The city has done a yeoman's job of trying to get sand for you. We're looking at a renourishment in 2014, but now we've got the sequestering. So I don't know if the sand's going to come or not. I don't know where it's coming from, and I appreciate the fact that you keep up the beach there. But I also look at what Chris brought up about um, coming in and eminent domaining something. I'd like to be able to go back and eminent domain all those places on the canals that we cut off and we vacated. And if we tried to do that right now, we'd pay the wrath of the citizens of Satellite Beach for going back in an eminent domaining something. And the same scenario would occur if we vacated these properties and found out that we could do an exfiltration project that would share storm water into an area that we could divert it off of A1A for, and we don't have the ability of doing it. So I'm not in favor of doing this. I also know that we're looking at something on Sheridan, 
And when that came up at the CRA meeting, I was in favor of looking at it, but I'm going to be looking at it entirely different the next time it brings up because I look at it as a shared stormwater area. Rather than vacate it to one individual, we can use it as an area for multiple properties to use for stormwater runoff and make some of the lots on A1A more viable. So I'm, I'm not interested in vacating these parcels. I think the city has done its due diligence. Um, there's a reason why we're here doing it this way because we don't have access to the river anymore. And there's other places that we vacated properties for that we don't have access to, things that we probably would like to have access to now. Okay. Uh, I, I just got one last comment. If you have not, which I imagine the public has not seen this, but I would take an opportunity to get a copy of this from Lenore, the Meachman Clark letter, LLC. Uh, March 6, 2013. You can go through this and peruse it at your own interest, and you may see why I have my reservations on moving forward with this. But this, this in, a, in, a, in conjunction with uh, Councilman Montanero's, is a, a deep concern. So please take a look at those two documents. Uh, I have one statement. Oh, question. I have a I, I have one more comment. Then I'll uh, let you have another one to speak. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead. You know, last night at the comprehensive, uh, when we reviewed the comprehensive planning, uh, the comp plan. Uh, it was brought forth to this the, this council that the sentiment of this community is that they basically want the people on the canals and the people on the beach to go away. Mr. Montanero just admitted it. If we're up to him, he'd use eminent domain to move everybody out of the canal area. That's not what I said. Uh, How do you misconstrue yeah, no, what I, I said? Heard, Wait, I'm tired of you misconstruing what I said. You, I heard it. Oh, you're no, it, it's honor. pretty obvious based on no, the right, decision that the city no. does not want to work with the beachfront owners or any waterfront owners with respect to improving their property or maintaining their properties. Okay, thank you. Here's my feeling on it. I'm not really for giving property away, um, but I'm not for lumping all these together because I... Steve said something is not everything is always black and white or it's going to be the same throughout the whole process. I, I don't like giving it away. I can tell you I lived here when I could use every canal. And the end of the canals are gone. We had a boat ramp at the end of Jackson, gone. We, we live on a, a city on the water. And we gave it away. So I'm not for given the way, but I'm not for grouping. I don't like grouping all this together, and I really want a policy. would like to see a policy in place so that we have it. That way we have some guidelines to go by. That way it's not changing every time we have council. Different council. So, anyway. Any other comment? Okay, call the vote. Uh, what, what was the motion to deny all, all of them? Yes. No. Yes. 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 No. Okay. Passes three to two. Um, at this time, I'd like to take a break before we start on our next agenda item. We'll get about ten minutes. Thank you. To agenda item number ten by the police department on the record management system. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Acting Police Chief Brad Hodge will be making a presentation on the status of the very extensive research done on the potential vendors for a uh, RMS and CAD, which is Record Management System and Computer Aided Dispatch. Chief? Thank you. Good evening. Um, I know this is uh, kind of a dry subject. I've asked Chief Cody from Rockledge Police Department to stand behind me and flex a little bit to try and add some budget to it. <laughs> he pulled the muscle. Um, I just want to very briefly Get the clicker to work. Acknowledge the team of people that worked on this project over the last several months, uh, really since mid-year last year is when our team began working on it. Uh, but I certainly want to take a minute to recognize them. Uh, we have vast experience on the team that was involved in this. Uh, picking out a record management system and mobile data terminal system is not something where you open up a catalog, point to one, say this looks good, and I hope it comes in blue, and then run with it. Uh, there's a lot of components that are involved, there's a lot of different people that are involved, and each person you see up here on the screen uh, starting uh, really the discussions with, with Chief Cody uh, many years ago, uh, all the way down through uh, members of KPEG, which we'll discuss 
in, in just a few minutes. Uh, there was a lot of, there were a lot of people involved in this process, and not only were they involved from their expertise standpoint, but they're also involved as, as longtime members of the department and supervisors that certainly understand the, uh, the, the fiscal climate and, and challenges that the city is faced with. Our past efforts uh, in pursuing a, an RMS, or records management system and mobile data terminal, uh, really started as a discussion as early as 2002. Um, it became a main focus uh, when uh, Chief Pearson was, was a commander around 2006. Uh, we did explore several funding sources, including two consecutive grants that we applied for, both which were denied. Uh, we were stalled uh, in, in the years following due to budget issues, and then uh, the KPEG review in 2012 really got us kind of back to the forefront. Where we had some citizens come in, really take a look at what was going on within the police department, and, uh, and realize that we are uh, in, in the stone age when it comes to technology at the Satellite Beach Police Department. I did want to include, uh, and, and I don't generally read from my slides, but I do want to include this, this uh, quote from KPEG on page 72 to kick us off. Uh, RMS, which is a records management system, enables an integrated and centralized police records management system for preserving data integrity and enhancing departmental efficiency. With this integrated system for police records management, the police department can update, share, and access critical data via one centralized database, enhancing communication and improving the efficiency of processes. This, organi this organized information can be easily transmitted car to car, dispatch to car, and then state or federal agencies. And that's really what we're here to talk about, is the communication between not only our agency and the clerk's office, but our agency and the state attorney's office, our agency and federal agencies, and our agency and other agencies in Brevard County. Um, we hear, please speak English, uh, plain talk enough uh, in these meetings. So the way I'd like to start this is very basically for you to describe what each of these systems do so you can understand uh, what an RMS is, because we all love to speak in, in acronyms, as the fire chief knows. Um, a records management system is simply a system, a uh, computerized system that uh, maintains all of our pertinent data, our incident reports, our arrest reports, our uniform crime reports, which collects annually our crime rate in the city of Satellite Beach, master name files, things like citations and warnings, evidence and property inventory, and on and on. It's a centralized database that maintains all that critical data, some of which is required by federal law. The CAD, which we'll talk about quite a bit tonight, too, is a computer-aided dispatch. This is our control center for the police department. This is where the dispatcher sits, and they enter all the data on every activity that an officer or firefighter performs. They're time-stamped for court purposes. Uh, they're up to second statuses of all units for supervisors in the field. They provide alerts of hazardous situations. For example, if an officer is dispatched to a call where we've gone before and there's a violent person living there, as they're dispatched, it will come up in the dispatcher screen that says that this man is in possession of a firearm and has violent tendencies towards law enforcement. Uh, so it provides all of those things. Uh, all ongoing law enforcement and fire activity is what our CAD provides. Maybe turn that a little bit. <coughs> Thanks. The mobile data terminals, we currently do not have these in, in Satellite Beach. You can see, and everybody's seen them on television, I'm sure, and in other police cars, but uh, there's, there's a computer terminal in there that is tied into our computer-aided dispatch. Uh, it also has instant access to the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, driver's license checks, warrants checks, uh, crime and incident reports, and immediate criminal reports and bulletins from other police departments, whether it's around the county or around the state, go directly to these data terminals. Uh, we do not have these currently in Satellite Beach. What we do have is uh, a very basic records management and CAD system. Our current system was purchased uh, in 1999 for $49,800. It provides basic functions of the computer-aided dispatch. It maintains the officer's activities. Our records management system uh, also maintains basic arrest files, trespass warnings, citations, things like that. Uh, our maintenance fees currently are about $6,700 a year. We have basic support with those maintenance fees of Monday through Friday, 830 to 430. Since the release of this software in 1999, there's been a number of modules. The company that we went with uh, operates on a modular system. 
If you want something, you pay for it. Once you pay for it, you add maintenance fees to those things. What we found over time is we discussed upgrading this system, but the costs of keep piling things on uh, and adding maintenance fees uh, pretty soon got to be a serious budget consideration <coughs> Excuse me, over the years. And uh, at the time, it was just cost prohibitive. I'm going to go to this slide because I'll go back to it later, but currently these are all the things uh, that our system cannot do and should. We have a mandatory uh, submission of uniform traffic citations, county, uh, statewide actually in 2014. We have uh, mandatory electronic submission of all traffic crash reports. Our system cannot do that currently. Uh, electronic submission of incident and arrest reports. Uh, the city manager and I just had a meeting with Phil Archer from the state attorney's office, and their staff is currently working on going paperless and requiring uh, electronic submission of all arrest reports to his office and then subsequently the clerk and, and through the state on up. Uh, that's pending in 2014. Electronic submission uh, to the records management system from the field, we can currently not do, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, electronic review and approval by our supervisors from the field uh, of reports that officers complete, we cannot do. Access to state and federal criminal databases, which I explained a minute ago, we cannot do. Uh, receive instant criminal bulletins and communicate uh, between officers in the field. None of those things our current system is capable of. In order to, uh, to improve our services through technology, we do have to naturally add some, some uh, programs. We have to add, it's going to be a cost, obviously. Uh, but one of the, the striking things that we found over the last few weeks of research is currently the Satellite Beach Police Department is only one of two agencies in the four surrounding counties and Brevard County that does not have this technology. The only other police department is Melbourne Village, and I believe they have three police officers. We do not have any of the technology that all these other agencies do with regard to mobile data terminals uh, and the transmission of information. There's just four things that I want to uh, outline here that we're going to talk about. Uh, certainly, once we update our technology, we'll bring our, our department into the current age of mobile data terminal uh, and records management. We'll improve efficiency in delivering law enforcement services. Uh, we will certainly meet county and state report, uh, report require, requirements and improve effectiveness of the communications division. I'll talk about each one of those individually. First and foremost, bringing real-time information to the officers in the field. Uh, anytime an officer needs to access anything under our current system, they have to pick up the radio and they have to call the dispatch center, and this will tie into the upcoming slide with communication. Whether it's a driver's license, traffic check, a warrants check, getting a bulletin, uh, giving a bulletin, any of these things, uh, they pick up a microphone, they talk to a dispatcher in the station, the dispatcher enters that information, then the dispatcher gets on the mic and they call it back. Uh, in every other police department but one that you've seen in our county areas, uh, the officer has access to all that information right on their mobile computers. They can run driver's license checks, they can do all these things from the field. This certainly reduces the time that they're spent in the field particularly when we put in the electronic traffic uh, ticket uh, right, <coughs> writing system along with the electronic trash, uh, crash reporting, uh, eliminates their time in the field, or improves their time in the field, uh, and it interconnects our agency with other agencies in the county that may be on the same platform. Uh, if there's a crime occurring, uh, whether it's in Cocoa Beach and we do not share a radio channel with them, we will get those instant bulletins that I mentioned earlier. We believe that because this is going to be uh, a paper, basically a paperless workflow, uh, that we are going to increase the efficiency of our police officers. And I believe that's one of the things that Cape had recognized when they came in as citizens observers and saw some of the downtime that we spent doing various tasks because of the limitations of our technology. Uh, a very simple example that I can give you of this is our current report writing procedures go something like this. A police officer responds to a call in the field and it requires a written report. That officer conducts the call, he clears the call, and we require our police officers to complete their reports in the field. That just means that they're going to type them out on a laptop computer that we provide. It doesn't have any connectivity. We do that so we can keep them in the field longer on proactive patrols. When they're done with that report, they drive to the station. They actually take, and yes, I'm not misspeaking, a floppy disk 
They put it in their computer, they copy it to a floppy disk, they take it into the station, they copy it onto a hard drive. The supervisor then drives to the station, gets on that same computer, opens up the report, and either approves or denies the report. If the officer is going back in service and there's a problem with the report, the supervisor of the station calls the officer to return to the station to make the corrections and then they both return to duty. This is not just with our report writing system, this is also with our traffic crash component because they have to be electronically submitted to the state and we can only do that right now from inside our facility. With the new mobile data terminal system, it's a complete in the field instantaneous process. All the same scenarios occur except this time when the officer completes the report on his laptop, he transmits it to a supervisor who's in the field. The supervisor gets an icon on their screen that shows that there's a pending report to be approved. The supervisor opens that report, looks through it, approves it, pushes a button, and sends it to the station, which in turn will forward it on to the appropriate agencies. If it's rejected, the same thing. It returns to the officer in the field. He gets an icon, corrects it, sends it back. They never come back into the station. This is true with the traffic reporting, and this is also going to be true, hopefully, with the ticket writing software. Of course, we already talked about this, so I'll kind of go through this quickly, but we all know that the traffic citation uh, mandatory electronic reporting is coming up January 1. We have pending mandates uh, right from Phil Archer's mouth to us uh, last month, uh, and currently all traffic reports are submitted electronically, and we don't have the capability to do that from the field. Communication division effectiveness. Again, KPEG noticed this when they went in. Our communications division is staffed about 80% of the time with one dispatcher. We do supplement by overlapping shifts, and we do have some part-time hours. Uh, our philosophy has always been to have a minimum of two-person dispatch system at all times. Because of budget challenges, we've not been able to do that. I know the fire chief would, would instantly walk up to the podium and talk about uh, the critical time spent when a dispatcher is involved in a call and gets a simultaneous call. And when you have a dispatcher that is involved in, say, a, a full-blown fire, and we have officers that are involved in high-risk events, one person doing all those things is nearly impossible. So we've been very creative with both our, both our funding and our, our schedules to try and accomplish this two-person coverage, but quite frankly, it just can't be done. We've been asking for uh, and, and trying to negotiate for an additional minimum two full-time dispatchers over the last few years. Uh, we understand the budget limitations. Uh, this didn't go very far, but that's what we need to cover our dispatch. We know that by implementing a system like this, we can most likely eliminate one of the dispatch positions that we would ask for. This is not to say that we would eliminate a current full-time dispatcher, but it would eliminate the critical need to add more dispatchers to our comm center uh, because of the alleviation of the, the, the technology. I sent this in your handout, so I won't go over it unless anybody had any questions on it. This one went home in your packet. Uh, pretty straightforward graphic. It just shows that naturally it's going to go from our vehicles to the police department, records management, and dispatch to the right, and then all the appropriate state agencies, Florida Department of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Highway Safety Motor Vehicles, the clerk's office, and the state attorney's office. We have um, two options that uh, we are currently recommending. Uh, Pretty straightforward, we can update our basic operating system that we purchased back in 1999, or we can replace the existing system with a newer, complete system and go with a new vendor altogether. <coughs> Very briefly, uh, again, as I mentioned, as, as I opened up, that there were a lot of staff members with, I believe, 125 years of collective experience in law enforcement that did these reviews. We did site visits. We traveled to agencies uh, that had vendors in place that we have examined. We talked to their command staff, we talked to their users, we talked to their janitors, we talked to everybody involved that had their hands on this system in some way. Uh, you see the, the divisions that were represented through records, communication, patrol, uh, evidence, property, and command staff, of course, and then uh, Mr. Jagutis and Bill Wagner were involved in some of those proposals, and they also basically heard uh, my proposal last week in my office and our recommendations and uh, unless anybody's changed their mind it was uh, they were they were giving us the green light to go forward with what we're recommending tonight I've done my ABCs to make it real simple for me um, I did 
three basic components of the cost here. The, the, the uh, proposals that we got are proprietary and they're confidential. So I can't put them up on this screen, uh, but I can talk about them generally. The costs are general. There, there will be some variations, but uh, we would not come back and ask for $75,000 to add a component. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. The three major components that we're going to talk about are the system costs itself, the infrastructure upgrades, and then again, uh, and then the annual maintenance to keep this thing going. I know we're going to say sticker shock here in a minute, but the outright purchase of the current system upgrades that we have right now are represented in yellow, 193,570. Uh, the new system vendor A that we reviewed uh, is 336, 318, and then the new system vendor <coughs> B, 382, 791. These are the three systems that we decided were best uh, for our agency uh, to review and come to a final consensus on one of these, which I'll get to. To upgrade our current system, uh, there's a few things involved in our infrastructure upgrades. They include upgrading our current servers, security systems in-house, licensing, and of course, all the equipment in the vehicles uh, associated with the mobile data terminals. And these costs are also tied into the fire department equipment maintenance, uh, servers, all those other things. The fire department will actually have five units that they work off of in their trucks to log times and all those things. The annual maintenance fees is C. You'll see that there's some variations here. Uh, some offer minimal one-year charges, some no charge the first year, and then they go up incrementally. Uh, what we've been told by each vendor is uh, generally the increases over time. Uh, our first five years would be negotiated at about these costs. The six through ten year, they open it back up for negotiation. Uh, but that's certainly something that we can um, <laughs> have some leverage with if a system isn't uh, approved to lock in some of these costs. Generally, they go up three to five percent a year, uh, but they sometimes tie in with the CPI as well. The wireless connectivity for the vehicles, and, and really what we went into here is leaving no stone unturned. We don't want to come back five years from now and say, oh, by the way, uh, some people don't realize that for $9,100, we need air cards for our computers. They have to be able to talk to each other. The fire department has to be able to talk to our communications uh, uh, division. So $9,100 for wireless connectivity per year. That's all Verizon State did. And then a total, I, I, I did a total five-year cost on, on the maintenance fees, uh, and you see each vendor there and uh, about what they amount to. The total five-year costs, uh, I built everything out so you can see the real hands-on, what a system's going to cost you uh, after five years. Um, obviously, the upgrade uh, is a little less. The vendor A is 614, 581 because they have some increased fees over time. And then the new vendor B, 596, 941. Lastly, they provided us some finance options. I am not responsible for the interest rate. That's what they called in. I know it's some one in particular one is not very realistic, but I went with what they provided in writing. Uh, the five-year finance terms for the system itself, they would roll in the, ma the maintenance fees. Uh, the only thing that's not in this number is financing the air card service that goes through Verizon. Uh, and you see the cost there, 117, 170 versus 124, 737 versus 116, 330 uh, over the five-year term. There were a couple that offered seven-year financing. We didn't go that far out. Our supervisors got together after providing, uh, conducting all the uh, vendor visits, the evaluations, the interviews, and uh, there was an unanimous recommendation for vendor B uh, this is certainly the most comprehensive system that we've seen. Um, it's certainly not a toy, and it's not everything they offer. Uh, we understand that, the, that we're not on a Mercedes budget, and so you know we went with the Honda scooter version uh, that will get us where we need to be. Um, believe it or not, Vendor B gave us a significant price reduction uh, because they're targeting every law enforcement agency in Brevard County, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, we based our decision on user reviews during the site visits, uh, and also 
two very important things. They have a countywide users group because they're already in four agencies in Brevard County, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, and they have a statewide users group uh, that meets quarterly that both of these type of users groups can pressure, for lack of a better term, uh, this company for that much more improved uh, service, customer support, uh, and new technology to be offered based on what the users need. All the things I showed you earlier, I won't go back through them again, but we changed everything from a no to a yes. Everything our system doesn't do uh, can now be accomplished. With vendor B, uh, we will interconnect Satellite Beach with the other agencies that you see here that are already on board with this system. Like I said, the goal is to interconnect the entire county. Uh, I know that Osceola County, uh, where I've done accreditation reviews, and Seminole County uh, are all connected through one RMS. The difference between them and us is that uh, Osceola County has two municipal police departments and a sheriff's department, and Seminole County has four. It's a lot easier to get all those people on the same page. And so the fact that we already have four uh, in Port Canaveral, Rockledge, Cocoa, Titusville, Cocoa Beach is currently evaluating uh, and negotiating. And I was at the uh, Chief's dinner last Wednesday night, and I grabbed a hold of the sheriff, and I pulled him outside because I know their system is obsolete, uh, and they're getting ready to replace it. And I said, Sheriff, tell me what you're going to do, because for us to talk to the Sheriff's Department and the jail is really big. And I don't want to go pitch this and get some money from our city council and come back in three years, and they say they're going with another company that's not our vendor B choice. And he said, I can tell you that we're looking at the same vendor you are. I can tell you you can quote to your council that the sheriff would be most inclined to go with the company that has the most agencies in Brevard County. I just can't make a commitment to you right now. Uh, I do know that vendor B is in negotiation with the sheriff's department as well as Cocoa Beach currently. Again, here are the agencies in our area that has Vendor B, along with the agencies uh, around the state of Florida. Uh, significantly more agencies, uh, both statewide and nationally, than the two other vendors that we looked at. This is an older number. Uh, vendor B that we're recommending currently has about 1,400 agencies in 48 states uh, across the U.S. Uh, just a quick summary, obviously uh, we, we did significant research uh, going right to the people that had these systems. Uh, we needed to meet all of our reporting requirements. Uh, we knew that we wanted to look to the future and not buy a system that's just going to work today, not buy a system that's going to get us by for a couple years. Uh, and when we look at the particular recommendation that we made, it's because we're going to meet all of these needs and it's going to have some longevity down the road. And as the other agencies come on board, it's going to connect Satellite Beach with the other agencies in the county, just like everybody else is, is moving towards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question from Council? It's embarrassing to think how far behind we are in this technology. That's a good word. <laughs> I didn't think it was appropriate to end my slideshow after we were the only ones in the Fort County area, but... Brad, just got a quick question, a couple questions, actually. When when it goes from the air card, when you transmit from the car to the, to the station, is that encrypted? Yeah, very much so. Okay, so, what's, so what is the hacker security that, it, that, it, that the system provides? Adam? Uh, there's encryption built into the software. Okay. Okay. Can 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 the officer also offload that onto their own disk at the same time? In other words, I'm worried. Does it does the information just go to the to to the police department, or could the officer offload that as well? Essentially, the officer only has access to the information that they create. Okay. Um, they can't duplicate that that information. They can't download it anywhere other than to send it to a supervisor. That's what Once asking. the supervisor receives that information, it becomes a read-only document and it's protected. Okay. And we're also protected through the criminal justice information system guidelines. We just went through our audit. And I'm here to tell you, it's a bear. And they come in and look at all of our securities. They interview Adam and they go through all of our firewall systems. Uh, and this is probably three or four steps above what we have now. Okay. <clears throat>
when you open a document, whatever document that happens to be, is your fingerprint on that document from there forward? I mean, in other words, I don't want to be, I don't want to go in and look at your document, and you never know I'm looking at your document. That's yes. Okay. So is, is all that stuff fingerprinted? Yes. And so interestingly enough, there was just a case, I believe, out of Osceola County, where a deputy went and changed a report because someone close to her was arrested, and she wanted to water down the probable cause. And it timestamped that, showed who gained access to the system, and this absolutely does that. Okay. That's all I have for now. <coughs> Thank you. Well, hallelujah. I, I, I know that gentlemen know that this was on my radar last year, and, and uh, I was absolutely shocked when it's been a discussion and now a mandate for so long, and nothing's been done about it. And uh, when the budget was done last year, we strongly encouraged, or I did anyway, that that capital asset money be held in reserve to help pay for this system. So. Um, no, we just need to talk about where the money's going to come from. And I believe we did put this in the CIP to about the tune of four hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So we weren't terribly far off. And of course, we're building way out and hopefully remembering every single thing. Yeah. Well, it needs to be done. Okay, one, one more. Um, systems implemented. One of the costs that's oftentimes not figured in on this is the, is the staff and the officer training requirements to bring these people up to speed. Uh, any feedback on how many hours it's going to take and are we looking at overtime? How, how are you going to do the training for this? Because this is going to be a big change, I would think. Sure. We would, we would uh, the training is built into the cost from the vendors already. Okay. The travel time and all that is okay. already built in. Like I said, we hopefully left no stone unturned. As far as the training goes, uh, we cur our current schedule supports two training days a month. Uh, each squad goes to a training day on Fridays. Uh, we purposely overlap the squads on Fridays, so whether it's range or CPR, or whatever the case may be. In this particular instance, all we would do is make those training days part of our RMS, mobile data terminals, uh, computer update training. Okay. The timeline, uh, the vendors tell us uh, it's possibly a six-month-plus period, although he says they just basically say that uh, as a sort of a fail-safe. Uh, they, because they just get agencies in Brevard, they're here. Uh, they said that they can probably get it done in about three to four months. To, to follow up on that, can some of the training be done from home, or does it actually have to be in, in the office itself, the training? In other words, could I, could I access it and learn some of the stuff that needs to be learned? No, you have to come into face to face. Okay, right. right. What, what's the timeline that we're looking at implementing this? And is it this budget session or is it next budget session? If, if you write a check, it's the minute the bank opens in the morning, I can get started. <laughs> um, the, timeline, the timeline is when, when, you, when you tell us. Uh, essentially, we've had some discussions. Uh, the one company, and I can't get back to the slide right the second, but the one company is offering the first year uh, at no cost. Uh, they're offering the, the last payment, <coughs> excuse me, in arrears. So uh, if it's timed properly, it could possibly be put off to budget years. Uh, it's just um, how, how council wants to work that. Is that D? Is D the yes, one that was going to do is. that? Yes. So basically, January 1st is when the system has to be upgraded. So you're looking six months, so really the system needs to be in. July at the latest, correct? Correct. Okay. Then if we were going to go into a budget year, this actually could be, if you worked it out right, 14, 15, it would start. Correct. correct? If you, technically, if we signed the contract, uh, and, and the first payment could be October 2nd, 14, 15, you're right. Okay. Does the interest occur? For the first year, no. Okay. That's a pretty good deal. It's interesting deal. Yeah. Well, you still got to pay for it, but I mean, you still got to pay for it. Still, it's a debt out there that you got to take care of. It's getting but. us, it's getting us up and running. And I think that vendor B was very much meaning to get your attention because they know that their foothold is strong in Brevard, and they get Satellite Beach and Cocoa Beach sees that they get Cocoa Beach, and the more they move up the ladder. And I can tell you this: we saw their original proposal. Uh, and the acting city manager called them and said, you got to do better than this. And they came back with almost uh, a 50% cut on their system. That is probably one of the top five systems in the country. As, just, to, just to give you the significance, the quote in my office when I said to the, to the, to the vendor representative, I said, you, you have got to do better than that. I, I, can't, I can't bring that here. I can't bring that number here. 
when he came back with that number that was almost 50% lower, he, that's when he, he handed me the proposal and said, and I, I'm going to leave the office and I'm going to take that because it's proprietary and I don't want, that's why you're not seeing the actual proposals because then other, well, you know how that works. Other people are going to look and go, well, this is what you gave them and this kind of deal. The other issue is the in arrears. That's also not something that they normally do that had to be approved, I believe, by the CEO. I'm, I'm not sure. There was a couple things that had to be approved by then. That's how strongly they want to, because they know that, that we're the tipping point, I believe. And they know that there's four other huge agencies in Brevard County that are currently using this vendor. And they know that Cocoa Beach is basically sitting there waiting to see what we do. So now you've got more than 50% of the agencies. Now what's the sheriff going to do at the end? I mean, we, I can't speak for him, but like he said, if almost all the agencies in the county have this particular vendor who's a tier one vendor who does everything that can be done, where if are they going to go? If I could just address the upgrading our current system, which is clearly the cheaper option. Um, without bashing them, on YouTube we went up to uh, an agency and visited with that agency. Uh, and they were less than pleased. This agency bought their system in 1998 and did all the upgrades through mobile data terminals and records management two years ago, just as we're proposing to do now. They were less than pleased with the customer service, and they also said, uh, my closing question to the commander over that division as I left that day was, if you had a little bit more money, would you have gone with this system or another one? And he said, we would have gone with somebody else. And so that's why we are shying away from, even at the savings, uh, building onto the system that we bought in 1999. Okay. Any other comment from council? Open up for public comment. First of all, I'd say that uh, Wild Cody Satellite Beach, the resident, uh, his presentation is actually excellent and right on target. We've known that we were going backwards for the last seven or eight years. Uh, we've been trying to play catch up, there hasn't been any money. Do you know before the budget comes out how much money to ask for? And so as a result, we're in this predicament. The city of Rockledge bit the bullet two years ago. We went with New World and we have a little over 800,000 in our system currently, but we expect it to be right around two million by the time it's completed. Because uh, we have 52 offices, which is a little more than twice what Satellite Beach has. Uh, we have more territory, but uh, we have we we come up with a system that's compatible with the. I think he he was using us as an example in some of those al analogies without mentioning it. But I talked with Alan Schultz a few months ago, and I know if he wasn't a genius, our system wouldn't be operating today. I know the time has come that you have to bite the bullet and and and, and go the long route. Uh, we went with IPTM years ago in the early 80s, and we went and Satellite Beach went with USA Software. USA Software, we never kept pace with them, and they never kept pace with us. We were never able to get the upgrades that we should have gotten, and so we've suffered for that. Uh, IPTM went out of business, so we, we bit the bullet big time, but that's the kind of money that uh, these major systems cost and uh, for the upkeep and for the initial expenditure. Thank you. Thank you. John Fergus, 135 Nathan. Uh, some months ago, I tried to figure out how they're operating now. Spent a bit of time in there. I couldn't get my head around it. I don't know how it works. They make it work. But I'll clue you. If Sherry Driggers drops dead or retires, you've got a catastrophe on your hands. And there's other single point failures in there. This is not a, well, let's put it off till next year and we'll do it. This is a must-pay bill. How you do it, I don't know. But you cannot not do something. Otherwise, we might as well just say, shut the department down and let's let the sheriff take care of us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Joanne Meekin, resident. Um, the prior two speakers have alluded to this, and that was a nice presentation. Um, I just have a question, is what is our redundancy plan for Adam? Okay, fine, resident. Um, living in this city for 
God knows how many years. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, I have not only financially involved, but I have some emotional ties to the city. Uh, I can remember how proud I was that Satellite Beach was the first police department to gain accreditation. I can't tell you how dismayed I am to hear how far we've fallen behind. Um, we have probably the best services around. <laughs> Proud of the fire department getting me to the hospital after my heart attack. Proud of the police department being there when I needed it. Proud of public work getting me back in my house and after hurricanes, we have, you know, in a timely manner. We have the best services around. And a lot of people say, well, what are we paying this for? What are we paying that for? Well, that's what we're paying for. It's because we are the best and have been in the best past, the best in Satellite Beach. I, one thing enters my mind, and I might be wrong how uh, I view this presentation. Currently, if Sergeant Anderson pulls over a uh, traffic stop, he's got no clue unless the driver's, the, the license plate comes back as stolen or whatever. He has no clue what he's approaching. Absolutely nothing. He gets out of his vehicle and he approaches that vehicle. However, with that system, the way I understand it, with that system, all you have to do is hit a few keys and he'll know whether the individual driving that vehicle is violent or whoever was driving. Whether he needs a backup, he needs more caution, what he needs to do to keep himself safe. The whole thing is, I think it happened in Tampa or Jackson, where two police officers got out of their vehicle, normal traffic stop, and within six seconds after, they were dead. Why? They did not know what they were dealing with. We need to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? <coughs> Roger Goodis, resident of Satellite Beach. Thank you, Acting Chief Hodge and Acting City Manager um, Pearson. Um, the evolution did start in KPEG in getting this to the wheels in motion. And I know the officers, everyone who has worked on this, once they got going in the right direction and understanding this, they did go through many systems to learn what was going on. One of the things I'd like to say is, if I'm not mistaken, part of the annual fees also uh, includes automatic upgrades for the system, and that is critical. Uh, I think that's what was part of the issue because it was a cafeteria plan in the past. You had to pay extra and extra and extra. This envelops that. And you should never be, you will probably not be behind the curve for the next five to seven years. But please be aware in ten years, it all may be going through this. It won't happen. So, but you do need this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Adam Schultz, Satellite Beach. Uh, to answer the citizen's question, first of all, I plan to live forever. <laughs> and second of all, uh, we are going to be upgrading other servers in the city this year, and we're going to be utilizing the services of a company called Computer Experts in Melbourne. They came in last year and did an analysis of our system and gave us some recommendations. And while we won't be going with their hardware, they have agreed to at least come in and, and help with the installation. And then that, that will give them a, a foothold in, into the city as far as being able to help us when we need it, if, if anything happens to me or, or if I, I can't do something. So uh, we do have that in the pipeline. Thank you very much. Okay. Any further, Steve? <coughs> Um, I just have some technical issues or questions, perhaps. Um, one of the things that Commander Hodge, that's a correct term? 
That's perfect. Okay. It all works all day long. I, I, I just want to be correct. Um, said that as long as the other group, meaning the other agency, is on the same platform, you can communicate with them. So with that, that I'm taking that to mean that if they're not, if they are on vendor A, if we go with vendor B, and that would mean that that direct type of interaction and communication could not be done with a vendor A. I understand that, and, and I'm just asking. Perhaps there's, I'm almost certain that there's somebody smarter in the room than me that can answer this, but I do know that there is software out there, Steve, where you can interconnect with other agencies, provided you get user agreements and memos of understanding, and then it requires uh, separate software systems. Uh, separate maintenance fees from another outside, a third-party vendor that ties those together. Okay. Um, that is possible, I do believe. The, the, re the reason I ask is, is somewhat twofold, is that one thing I know with communication devices, there's always a standard coming down the road from somebody, whether it's IEEE or the state, they are going to make a standard for the ability to communicate. It's just the, it's the nature of the beast. If that standard happens, would vendor B upgrade to that standard? Let's say it's vendor A standard. Would they upgrade to that standard as part of the maintenance agreement? I'd have to ask them that directly. Okay. I, I, does that make sense what I'm asking? Mark's nodding his head. Okay. So I, I'm on the same page. Lastly, I'm assuming that the Verizon cards are based upon the Verizon cell towers. Correct. I, I hate to even think about this, but cell towers run on electricity. When the power goes out, those cell towers have roughly two to three days of a battery backup. What do we do? Is there a backup system to when the cell towers go down and you're not being able to communicate? Because we, we go out, we can go out without power for a week. Well, worst case scenario is we go back to what we're doing right now, and that is calling everything into our comp center that operates off of the generator. They run things through their computer uh, and then back to the cars. Uh, there's also the ability to go back to the system. I say back to, it's basically what we're doing now. Um, to manually download reports uh, via the supervisor and uh, upload them into the RMS system at the station. Same thing for traffic citations, and then they're transmitted from the station uh, to whatever the appropriate agency is. Okay, so, so I mean, I'm assuming that if a hurricane hits, we're, a lot of people are going to evacuate. Um, but you're still going to be able to communicate to each other through, a, through an over-the-air current exactly wires. Over the now, yeah. Okay, that was my, my three questions. Thank That's you all very right. much. Thanks, Any further citizens' comment? Hearing none, bring it back to council. Council? Motion or uh, is it time to take any Well, action? don't we want to direct them to look at the finances and how this is going to be implemented if we're going to do B? That would be the, that would be the appropriate direction is I, I would suspect that yeah. if, if the council approves our recommendation, then we go back with the hard figures and come back with, come back with, the, uh, with the report on um, how, how you pay for it. And included in that would be the agreements with the company and the whole thing. I mean, you bring us the whole package, right? Right. Because Having gone through now that we've got the direction stuff, that yeah. that we can go with the, the the particular vendor, now we can start to get more more specific, more detailed. Start talking about the financing, even more detailed than that that he's already been, which has been extremely detailed. And then come back with the proposals in, in the uh, 14, 13, 14 range when the uh, when there might be some money for you though. Yeah, just I think you have by consensus that yeah. we want to move in the direction you just outlined. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much for the time. Thank you. Ron, thank you for working with those people. The group. Ron, thank you. Mayor, I, I appreciate you saying that because they, they, the two of them along with some of the other people really did spend a lot of time and, and, and I just again want to publicly thank uh, Bill Wagner and Ron uh, Jagutis for, for their help Thanks. and uh, of course the Chief and everybody else as well like he, uh, like he had. Thank you guys. Um, I believe we're on 13, discuss, take action on Community Redevelopment Agency Advisory Committee Charter Revision. 
Yeah, um, last time we talked about um, what I had uh, proposed and uh, the council came up with three additions that they wanted added. Uh, those additions are reflected in what we have here in front of us tonight. And there was also a question about um, 2B, uh, <coughs> originally said by June 15th, and um, I've changed that to July 15th with that note to council uh, regarding the timeline for when the uh, <coughs> Excuse me, tax valuations come in. Um, so the July 15 uh, time um, would be an appropriate date for that. Okay. Um, at the last meeting, I did not have time to look at this because uh, because I was uh, out of town and working, and I had a lot of time to look at it. And I'm going to make some additions to it, if you don't mind. It's going to take some time, and I have some comments on it. You ready? Um, I think the background is fine, but as far as the responsibilities, um, actually I'd like to see the format change to responsibilities, function, additional responsibilities, goes into membership, eligibility, appointments, terms, vacancies, organization, quorum, voting rights, officers and duties, the chair, the vice chair, and member subcommittees, and committee operations, and then staff services, a fully comprehensive, really, bylaw for um, the Community Redevelopment Agency Advisory Committee. Um, I don't really think it's a charter. I think we're, we are adopting bylaws. Um, I think it's like, important to have the bylaws. This is um, a committee that we put a lot of thought into. Um, we have a revised redevelopment plan that's going to be adopted. And basically, that committee is an advisory committee to the Community Redevelopment Agency. So even if this, uh, the council decides to adopt this and not part portions of this or take in the, this into consideration, um, there's just some things in here that don't make sense. In other words, you're going to request funding from the city council. Well, they're really going to be requesting funding from the community redevelopment agency. So it, it just really needs some cleanup. So if you want to go through it, I'll be happy to go through it. If you want me to put it in uh, written form um, and submit it for review, I'd be happy to do that. Council wishes? I would just move it as submitted. Let's move on. It's getting late. This is not bylaws, by the way. This is a charter. The city council approves the charter for this committee. The CRA will approve the bylaws for the committee. I'll make a motion to accept the draft CRA advisory committee charter that's been provided. I have a motion second. by Councilman Montanero. I have a second by Councilman Gott. Discussion? Further discussion? Yeah, I, I don't agree with it. I think that it's, uh, and you talk about, uh, you know, request funding from the city council. You're, this committee is not going to be requesting funding from the city council for redevelopment projects. We'll be requesting it from the CRA, and I think, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to look at it last time. I had an opportunity to look at it since the agenda came out, and I, I can't support it as written. I'll, I'll amend my motion to change E to E to CRA instead of City Council. Is the second of the motion agree to amend? And then, um, oh, if you wish, yes. Thank you. Okay. And also, um, on I, your perform other tasks as seem necessary by the City Council. Is this, a, is this an advisory board to the CRA? Am I correct or not? I'm sure the city council can make recommendations mm -hmm. the same way that the CRA can make recommendations. Well, I, okay. Well, it seems to me that if you're going to, that's fine. But I'm going to put this in the record. Okay. Further comment? Hearing none, open up for public comment. Public comment on this agenda item. Here are none. Bring back to council. Council, we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Right. Councilman Dan? No. Councilman Allen? Yes. 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 Passes 4 1. Moving on to agenda item number 14. Um, proposed agenda for the March 20th meeting. We have a chance to look at it. You can submit anything else 
new to Jeff. <coughs> what, what I would like, uh, Jeff, I'll ask you this number 10 on there. I know we're kind of just, just now getting the paperwork together on that. We have not gotten back together as a group yet. Don't you think it's a little early for that? Okay. I mean, I just wanted to run that past you. Yeah, we just put it on there so we can generate the discussion to see if it was ready or not. So okay. we can yeah. move I mean, we're, it to pending. We're, we're close, but I think we can hold a little bit longer until I get with Linda. And we all get with everybody on this. Got it. Um, one question on agenda item as it's listed here, nine. If I'm not mistaken, didn't we have time sensitive on that at so um, which, which on, on number nine agenda? That's our auditor's report. I thought we always time made that time sensitive. It was like eight o'clock or whatever. Is that correct? Yes. The the, the reason that's on there, and I, I, was, I might as well bring it up now. Um, as you know, the on the twentieth is the uh, law enforcement right. officer of the year meeting dinner presentations. And I really would like to go to that if I can. That being said, I'm considering moving the audit report to the first meeting in April because from what I understand, and as it says here, there's probably should be and needs to be a city manager response to it. I didn't feel like it might it would be the appropriate unless it's unless you unless you all are okay with it. If you're okay with me not having a response to it or being able to, to offer anything, then we can leave it. If not, then we might consider moving to the first. I think you need point. a response in your position. You've done that. That's and uh, as long as the first doesn't we're meeting all our requirements even though we do it on the first. We have no requirements that says we can't be later than the twentieth. No, uh, we I mentioned I talked to the finance director and um, Carl Riggs and Ingram, yeah, and it, I don't believe there's a there's an issue with moving it except one, and that is, I believe there's going to be a way to get the audit reports, but the CRA annual report is due by March 31st, and the CRA annual report has to have the financial statements. In the past, what they did because the uh, the uh, audit report was done prior to the end of March, they just took the, the approved, audited financial report, put it with the CRA plan or the CRA report and submitted that. So we're waiting to find out from um, Carl Riggs and Ingram if they can su supply me with what they can that meets the state requirement so that I can do the CRA annual report without having to have the full audited financial statements. I like that. You're done good. Yeah. <laughs> Council's wishes. I think if, uh, if you know, Jeff can provide that information, and if they're okay with um, getting the information for the CRA financial report before the end of March, I mean, we can do this in April. If it, and if and if, if not, and if not, and it has to be done, that it'll be on the twentieth, and I I just guess I'll be here. Thank you. It's okay. Or you don't have to be here. I mean, I think we could probably do it. Right? Yeah, I think it's important you go. You need to be there on that you need function. To be there, so. You know, I'm sure you all know that if it wasn't anything real important, you know, I wouldn't even mention it. But it... you're a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other agenda items for that meeting? Please give to, to Jeff when you come up with them. Yeah, this is a this is a light agenda, and I think that's a good idea because we're going to be in, uh, in the throes of all the meetings regarding the new city manager. So. Yeah. Yeah, and plus, normally, the audit has taken a little bit of time when they do it, and I know we want to make sure we're, we're there, so let's leave this one like Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to add some things to the pending list. I did get the one. That's Okay, you got the one? Yeah, that's absolutely um, right. The second one really was um, not a report on special events planning, but it was supposed to be um, coming up with a permitting process for, for special events, um, and that's been on the radar for over a year. So I just, just so you know, that's... Is that a rec board? Uh, yeah, it would go through the, the, the rec board, I, I guess. But it was really to, to uh, regarding permits for special events, coming up with a process since we don't have one or a, per, a permit application. Okay. Um, you got the other one. Um, I, I would like to see, and this one has come off the list, um, personnel policy update um, for the future 
Um, and then a follow-up on the maintenance agreement between Brevard County and the City of Satellite Beach. And Jim, you might have been updated on this regarding fleet maintenance. Um, we, we entered in an agreement with Brevard County to maintain our fire vehicles over at their fleet maintenance facility in Rockledge. And uh, when it went to the Brevard County Board of County Commissioners, there was an issue regarding insurance that was supposed to be dealt with, and then they could come back to us for approval. So we just need to follow up on that. Um, and then um, I went back through some of the old agendas that I can't, I always forget his name, the gentleman that was dealing with the pension and it, the majority, yeah, the that, he that kind of did, he came in a couple times and then he just disappeared. So we really kind of need to follow up and see where he is. Uh, have he paid his contract? Is he done his services? Um, McGrath, McGillagraph or something so, like that is ringing a bell. So that's something that needs to be followed up with. And of course, this one has been in, on there since last May, process for right, right away vacation. Any other? That's not all going on this next agenda. Absolutely not. No, yeah. it's on the pending. It's all on the pending. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, yeah. just, we're making a light one for the next one because of the audit. Okay. Okay, moving on uh, to agenda item number 14. Um, excuse me. Number 15, appointment to boards. <coughs> In order to you. Okay. You should have at the dais and your blinds those appointments, so please make sure to look at that when you're doing your appointments. Um, I recently received an email that um, this page from the Santa Monica Park Committee is no longer serving on the boards about um, adding one more regular member. And um, Eugene Matthews has indicated that if you have enough people to um, be appointed to the CRA Advisory Committee, that he would prefer to be serving on the Samson Island Park Committee. Um, at the first meeting in February, there was a, uh, a revised memo. Um, unfortunately, the old memo was followed, and uh, an appointment was done for Jamie Strayer for the Recreation Board for an alternate position, and we were full at that time. So um, I don't know if you need to make a motion to retract that that motion to appoint me. And um, going forward, there will be several um, vacancies in the first of this year, I think I'm going to leave four. Um, so you could be considered at that time. So from there, <coughs> you have had um, Ms. Montanero was um, interviewed this evening. Mr. Philip Welsh um, had changed his mind about the CPAP. He was going to um, be considered for PCA, PCAP as well. So we looking at this uh, application process to can start going forward. I see Mr. Eugene Matthews who wants uh, Samson Island. He's also for the Communication Board. We have two alternate members um, to fill on that vacancy. I don't know if you want to consider him for that or not. Okay, I move that we appoint Steve Osmer to the Code Enforcement Board, one of the regular members. Second. I have a motion by Councilwoman Gott, second by Council Montanero. Any further discussion? Hearing none, poll. Yes. Right yes. 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 I move we reappoint uh, regular member Lisa Crawford McRoberts to the CPAB. Second. <coughs> Motion by Councilman Gott, second by Vice Mayor Brimer. For the discussion. Here and none, please poll. Yes. Yes. Vice Yes. 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 I move that we appoint Barbara Montanaro to the Planning and Zoning Board as an alternate member. Second. Motion by Councilwoman God, second by Vice Mayor Brimer. I'd discuss. like to discuss this because um, Philip Welsh, when he interviewed, mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to be on the PZAB and he was very specific about that. He was for Pacific, now he wants it to be the CRA. No. no. Well, then what's? He was on our crack 
He, he was not. He, he, when he interviewed. Wait, he, just hold on a second, please. I have the floor. Thank you. On our applications for the CRAAC right here, he's on, on the last one. Okay. I, I, I had a markdown for the CRA. So but I, I, I remember very specifically, because I have this card, Paul Davis, he said he wanted to be on the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board. And we talked about this at the last meeting. Where did Philip Welsh go and why did he end up on the, CR, on the CRA Advisory Committee? Because he indicated that he would also consider at the interview serving on the advisory board. I know, but his okay. first choice was planning his own advisory board. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay. I'm going to call the council, please. Council No, I think uh, Philip should. Philip was there first. Council Montanaro. Yes. Vice Mayor Yes. Council Yes. Yes. I move to appoint uh, Eugene Matthews as a regular member to Sampson's Island Committee. Second. A motion by Councilman Gutt, second by Vice Mayor Bryan. Discussion? Here are none. Poll? Yes. 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 And regarding Mr. Strayer, um, if there was an error, it was made by the council. He was expressly interested, as I recall, in the rec board and had a fabulous background for that. And so I would say that we can just keep him on there as an alternate member. Okay. Um, appointment to the class. Do you have the voting? Uh, who, who do we know that's dropped off this list? Um, okay. Well, Eugene Matthews, we just appointed to another board. Philip Walsh is on the list. He is on the list. He's on the list. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, we, our thing was we voted for 11, correct? And Osmer has been, uh, Appointed to the uh, code enforcement. Correct. Let me just. I think that's all taken care of here. Mayor Chief, you know, if I could ask that they would use their tally sheets versus what was in the packet. Yes. Okay. So okay. So we vote for. I'm just making sure we're going to. Everybody has eleven votes. Okay. okay. But my question is, is that we we can, we can line out Eugene Matthews. And everybody else is in play, right? Um. But he's not on here. He's not on. So Matthews, we outline that. Right. Okay. Uh, how are we doing this? You vote for one. You vote for eleven. We're, we're one. Put a check mark check by mark. eleven names. Okay. And yeah, are we, she's going to count these now, Kelly. Sign it. Sign it. 
One other thing on the 14th, just to order business, the CRA board says 6 o'clock. That should be a 7. Say that again. The CRA, our board meeting on the 14th, needs to be a 7 o'clock start time. 7 o'clock, okay. 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 Eleanor, is there a retirement board meeting tomorrow? Yes, there is. Okay. Coming back from Tallahassee that day, and I hope to be back by that time, but it may be late. Okay. But it feels like a meat locker in here. Governor's Hurricane Conference, um, I would think that it would be valuable sending someone, uh, maybe even a staff or Alan Potter or... I was under the impression they didn't budget for that. There's um, nothing in the budget for that. But if we want to, if we feel it's critical, let's put it on... We can put it on, when is it? It's like April? May, 5 to 10. Well, let's put it on the next, the 20th. This, I've gone to this in the past, and it is definitely a wealth of information. This is one of the places where they have seminars. This is the seminar, one of the ones seminars that I went to where the city manager of Sanibel gave presentations on um, reimbursement for female and how you do things. And, they didn't have, they hired temporary workers to come in and do cleanup. And because temporary workers were not in their bank of job descriptions and their personnel, 
FEMA didn't reimburse for any of that. And when we came back from that, I believe we had somewhere in our personnel and stuff now, temporary employees. Who, you, who you handles that? Learn all kinds of stuff going right. through. Let me, who of staff handles the emergency management end of it? Well, Don Hughes is usually there. He yes, goes and teaches. Don is there. I can tell you he okay. will be there. What other staff member probably uh, would, would benefit to yeah. <coughs> see, see if we... Well, where is it first? It's in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale. Hawaii. Okay, well, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and just get, kind of find out where we could financially when they bring it back. They said, we're kind of thanks. And if, and if after the next meeting, if we're looking at doing that, we need to get both volumes quick because they hook up fast. Oh, well, he can drive back each night. <laughs> you know, <laughs> on this, and, and you can't say a mile, it's cheaper for a hotel. <laughs> We've got to be smart because budget is always an issue. Yeah. But on meetings and stuff of this nature, we really need, before we do budget and we're into workshops, the department workshops we do, and our own, we need to make sure that we at least look at a few of these that are important to go with. to start and then we need one for the alternate correct yes. all right um we have to start here we have three people with three that we need to vote one out of those three okay okay they are well wait a minute can you tell us who's well, I will, yeah well because yeah so i can do that but let's pick this and i can tell you the whole list is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me, before we do that, did we have to stagger these terms, so how are we going to determine who gets what term? Well, we can do that either by number or by vote of the, the CRA on. I would say the highest number of people. The people that got the highest number. I'm fine with that. As long as, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Let's get to 11 first, and then we can go from there. Right now, we have Terry Hammond with three, Ed Kinberg with three, and Rochelle Allendale with three. So we need to make a vote on um Kevin Kinberg and Londo, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I move Kinberg. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion by Councilwoman Gott, a second by Vice Mayor Brimer. Oh, oh, oh I didn't hear. Are we are these for member this is, there's okay, a tie. I'm sorry, I apologize, I just didn't hear. There's a tie. Those are there was three ties. And being Hammond, Kinberg, and Lowendows. Okay? Okay. There's a motion on the floor for Ed Kinberg. Okay. To break the tie. These are for alternates or Members, no. a membership. Just, yeah, member, yes, and then. I would think this would be an alternate on your numbering. Well, system. it will be by the numbering yeah. system, yeah. okay, but th we, we only have, there's. So let's vote. Hold on here, we got to vote. Let me just make sure I'm reading her 
right here. One, two, three, four. Right. We have ten, so we need. Lenore, I need two out of these. I need one out of them. We have ten. We need one out of them. That was right the first time. Okay. A vote for Ed Kimber. Pull the council. Uh, I'll second it. We already have a second. Oh, I, I didn't hear. Sorry. Okay. okay. Councilman Dina? Yes. Councilman Mosner? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Councilman Dodd? Yes. Mayor Dina? No. Okay. Hank Kinberg gets the 11th seat as an alternate. Now, let me read the list to you here. Morgan Neely, David Schechter. I'm reading them in order. Just read them. Right. You just want them read? Yeah, just read them. Yeah, just okay. tell us who they are. Owen Callard, Mike Chase, Sal D'Amato, Jeff Fleece, Ed Kinberg, Morgan Neely, Dave Omler, Linda Page, David Schechter, Alice Walden, and Philip Welsh. Okay. Now, we need to pick the alternates here. Well, to be well, doesn't the C won't the CRA do that on their meeting? No, we no, we took, we're we're going to point that. Already, time. Ed okay. Kinberg is already an alternate because well, that's not, no, not the not that what I meant was the terms being staggered. Oh, yeah, we have to do that. We're going to do it, not the right. Oh, we, also, CRA. we also we also pick the alternate. Okay, well the alternates. Okay, <clears throat> so Ed is one of them because he was. Okay. Vote yep. So one of the four. Okay. Let's let's do this. Let me read the fives out. They're obviously not an alternate. Right. Correct. Right. So we have Dave Schechter and Alice Walden and Morgan Neely. Okay. Now we have. We have six what? tied with four. Okay. okay. So one, one of those of has to be will be an alternate, oh, along with Mr. Kendrick. You said there's three fives? Excuse me. There was, oh, I apologize. Yeah, there's, three fives. there's two fives. Excuse me. Oh, two. Nope. There's three fives. There's three fives. There's three fives. Okay. Sorry. I got, there's numbers all over so here. There's three, three fives. Six, is, six, six nine. is nine, so you're missing one. Yeah, there's one missing somewhere. Oh. I've got 10 people listed and Kinberg makes 11. Right. And I have three fives. Then you must have seven. You must have seven four. One. Yes, I do. I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize. Um, Owen Callard, Michael Chase, Sal D'Amato, Jeff Fleece. I mean, excuse me. David Omler. Linda Page and Phil Welsh. So we need to vote for an alternate. Do I have a motion? I move uh, Philip Welsh. Second. I have a motion by Councilwoman Got second by Councilman Montanero to make Philip Welsh um, an alternate. Any discussion? Nope. Call the council. Councilman Yes. Vice Mayor Brown? Yes. Councilman Montanero? Yes. Councilman Goss? Yes. Mayor Yes. Okay. Um, can I make a suggestion? Since there were three that got five, can they be, they should probably be the three-year candidate? Yep. Agree. Agree. Okay, so the three-year candidates are Morgan Neely. Right. I'm going to cross them out here. So I, do you need this page back? No. Thank you. Morgan Neely, David Schechter, and Alice Walden, correct? Mm -hmm. Three year terms. Okay. Then the next is two year terms. Okay. How many do there need to be? 
to be three of three, those two. Of those two. Just, three of just those. take them at the top. Okay, so Howard, Chase, and Demato. Okay, um, I'd like to see Dave Omler on there more than the two, but just well, they can be reappointed. Okay, all right, three. The first three will be two years, correct? Yeah. Okay, and then everybody else is one year. Yeah. Okay. And they, they would actually, the, the one-year people would actually be eligible to be reappointed for two, two three-year terms after that. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, we need to um, select a chair and a vice chair. We selected the first Yeah, one. it's in the ordinance. You probably should so move your appointments for the number of years. Um, move the appointments for the staggered terms as indicated. Second. Second. Motion by Councilman Gott, second by Vice Mayor Brimer. Bernard? Councilman Gott? Yes. Councilman Gott? Yes. Vice Mayor Brimer? Yes. Councilman Yes. Yes. I'll make a motion to appoint David Schechter as the chair of the committee. Second. I have a motion. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I have a motion by Councilman Gott, second by Councilman Montanero to appoint Actually, I made the David motion. Schechter. You made the motion? Yeah. Didn't I? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. It's getting late. I apologize. A motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Councilman Gott to appoint Dave Schechter as the chair of the board. Further discussion? No. Hold the council, please. Yes. 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 I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Mike Chase as vice, vice chair. Second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Brimer, second by Councilman Montanero. To appoint Mike Chase as vice chair. Any further discussion? Lenore? Yes. 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 And those appointments are good until January when the committee uh, elects its own chair and vice chair. Yes. Any further <laughs> appointments to boards? Okay, hearing none. Any further business? Yeah, the minutes. minutes. You do the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes uh, from the February 6th meeting, the February 20th workshop meeting, and the... Uh, Can I back up? I'm sorry. Mr. Matthews, the authority is the same as I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the uh, February 6th regular meeting, the February 20th council workshop meeting, and the February 20th council meeting as written, as submitted. As submitted. A motion by Councilman Montanero. Second. Second by Vice Mayor Brimer. Any further comments? Hearing none, call the council. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Any further business now? Thank you for a long evening. Thank you guys for the work you did on that. No. This is, I, I'm, I'm,